Good evening. Thanks for being here this evening uh, at the regularly scheduled meeting of the Grand Village Veterans Village Board of Education. Would you please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for being here tonight. Some of you I know uh, came earlier. We had a forum that began at 5 o'clock tonight on school funding. Uh, it's an, uh, an ever-challenging uh, and engaging discussion item, and we will continue that discussion item as we move forward, and hopefully um, you'll be able to join us as we do that in the future and be able to share your views and opinions, and we'll have a public uh, comment section of tonight's meeting, so uh, if you have something to say about that or anything else that's relevant to the schools, feel, please feel free. In the meanwhile, we'll get uh, on with our regular business. Could you please take the roll? Mr. Jennings. Here. Ms. Miller. Here. Dr. Corman. Here. Ms. D. Here. Mr. Wall. Here. Right. Okay. So many of you are here for the commendation, so we're going to get started um, with recognizing our uh, GHS athletes who qualified to compete at the Division One, yes, and I said Division One, um, <laughs> OHSAA track and uh, field tournament at the Jesse Owens Memorial Stadium at OSU. I, I say that because um, Granville, 800 strong at the high school, competes with some of the school districts like Dublin, Olin Tangy, that have um, 1,500, almost double the enrollment size. So us competing with them is always going to be a challenge but as you'll hear we do pretty darn well and that's because of the quality athletes and coaches that we have in this room so that was a side note um, the GHS girls 3200 relay team of Alyssa Christian Rosie Lamb Kylie McFarland Riley Zink Maddie Long and Jenna Unkefer placed sixth and earned all Ohio honors Alyssa also placed fifth in the 1600 Rosie placed 15th in the 1600 and Riley placed 11th in the 3200. Um, good luck to the relay team. They are competing June 17th at the New Balance Nationals in North Carolina. Please come up with your coach, Jim Green. And take a <laughs> The next group that we're going to be honoring are our GMS Family and Career and Community Leaders of America members who brought home gold medals from the Ohio FCCLA leadership meeting and will compete at the National FCCLA Conference in Atlanta this summer. Wyatt Maloshenko, Trenton Walker earned first place with a perfect score with their project on preventing food waste and Kira Fuller won gold medal and first place for her teach and train project on preventing illness through hand washing. Congratulations and come on up, but as you're doing that, I just wanna say that I love these projects. Um, one of the things that Granville Schools has um, really shifted towards was learning for life and solving real world problems. And this is a perfect example of our students having a broader impact on the world and thinking about the content that they learn in the classroom in a broader context. So congratulations, FCCLA, come on up if you're here. <laughs>
GMS won first place in the Fairfield Challenge um, or Fairchild Challenge for the second year. Students participating were Sterling Bond, Sydney Folk, Maria Weiss, Sophia Minton Fry, Sierra Sarver, and Annika Washer, and Megan Penn, um, and the GMS food students in period six and period eight, who placed first place in the challenge called Growing Beyond Earth. This NASA plant experiment included producing two videos that summarized the Grow Box project and the importance of fresh food in, and nutrients of astronauts in future space travel. GMS uh, students won first, second, and third place in the challenges for healthy snacks and comfort food, and fifth and sixth in the second challenge, petals and pollinators, and first in the challenge three, in challenge three, a living history. Let's congratulation, congratulate all of our participants in the Fairchild Challenge. Come on up. <laughs> June, so typically we don't have anyone here. So I want to thank the people that came to uh, receive recognition. We appreciate that. So thank you very much, and that concludes our commendations. And we don't require people to sit. So if you want to leave, you can. It will not hurt the board's feelings. Well, it might, but uh, but you're free to go for the rest of your evening. If you want to stay and listen to the rest of the board meeting, you're more than welcome. To. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't have to tell them twice. <laughs> I didn't see him. Well, the students must be here. Because Jody Sturgeon's their hand over. Okay, Hannah, oh, there you are. Okay, so you and Noah are going to present. Um, do you want to go after, I, I queued up my board policy because I didn't see Mr. Redding, but do you want to go after that? Yeah. Okay, does, did Glenn have your, are they set up? No, need to open. Okay, all right. Well, I, I promise this won't take long. Um, the, Policy changes aren't significant right now. Okay, so uh, as you know, the uh, OSBA recommends certain policy changes um, as new things evolve in the General Assembly, and it's been a little bit slower spring since they couldn't figure out who was going to be the Speaker of the House. So that's actually been helpful for us <laughs> from a policy development standpoint. Um, the first items are really uh, the continual uh, tweaks to the evaluation requirements um, and specifically related to House Bill 64. Uh, a lot of this is just more uh, updating um, different uh, aspects of the reference sections of the board policies. So nothing substantial in that area. Uh, criminal records check, uh, that is just a reinforcement and an updating of the requirement for uh, getting criminal records checks, um, looking at the wrap back system and some of the aspects of um, how we solidify or, or uh, make sure that our, ensure that our staff have not been uh, criminals in the past. <coughs> um, I don't know how else to say that. Uh, next is also related to the hiring practices, professional staff hiring. Um, that is also related to the criminal backgrounds check. It's just a, it's referenced in two places. Um, Part-time and substitute professional staff employment. 
It's just an update to the uh, references. Um, again, GCN 1 and 2 are also related to ACF 1 and 2, so nothing changed there. It's just a reference. Um, suspensions and terminations of professional staff members, that is a relation to Ohio Revised Code 33-1917. Um, just an update there. Uh, nothing substantial, but it really just kind of outlines what is required in Ohio Revised Code. Um, recruiting staff and posting of vacancies and hiring practices is just a reference update. So you're seeing the trend here. Um, I already referenced that. Uh, suspensions, demotions, terminations, a reference. Career, career technical education and college credit plus. Both of those have um, new requirements as far as when we introduce career technical education opportunities for students, especially in the middle school and high school level. Um, so there are specific requirements now and a new requirement in College Credit Plus to notify people of their options earlier in, because uh, there's a requirement to have a meeting, it used to be um, in March, now it's in February. So it's just a changing of timeline for notification of College Credit Plus and career technical education options. Um, we do both, uh, Matt and Scott and the counselors do a great job of letting people know of the options available to them through College Credit Plus. Um, uh, JEDA is our truancy policy. That is ever changing with House Bill, House Bill 410 uh, and the requirement for absence um, tracking, not only um, for uh, ex unexcused, but now for excused absences. There are additional requirements and you're gonna see some um, additional changes in the handbooks related to the changes that are coming from attendance. Is that gonna end up in procedural or communication changes that we're yes. gonna to have to do? Yes, absolutely. Because we've already seen some of that the last couple of years, right? We have, we have. So th these, this is year two of House Bill 410. And so every single time we, we uh, get guidance from o ODE and from EMIS, we're making adjustments to our attendance policies. It's not fun. Yeah. Um, it's, it seems like we're kind of chasing our tails on that. Um, KKA is recruiters in the schools. That is, um, talks about how and when we can allow military recruiters into the schools and how they have to um, operate once they're there. Um, student teaching and internships, also just an update and then that other reference to College Credit Plus, again, is more of a timing. Um, there are some things on the horizon that if the General Assembly um, starts to move items, specifically related to OTES, the Ohio Teacher Evaluation System, there are three bills that are all aligned that um, carry some significant changes in OTES. I've been intimately involved in them at the Educator Standards Board. Um, I've advocated them for them at the General Assembly, and I believe they are in alignment with what, with what we do here in Granville and how we use OTES as a professional growth tool for teachers, not as a gotcha or you know a, a hammer from a, an employment status standpoint. So um, I'm looking forward to some of those uh, moves happening soon. Um, the other thing that, again, I will reference later is uh, related to um, the attendance policies that are evolving. And Jeff Gill works at the um, truancy office downtown, and he is our liaison for Granville Schools. He is continually uh, updating us with ways that we can um, update our policies and procedures to align with best practices. The nice part here is we don't have a significant truancy um, issue. Uh, but when we do, we want to make sure that the protocols and procedures are in place to help uh, get the student to school. So any questions on that? So one of the other, one item that uh, is, I'm going to let Matt come up and talk about is some of the changes that are related to the handbooks. Um, at the elementary level, uh, K-6 um, is a uniform handbook for our students and we really don't necessarily have a lot of changes except for the annual updates of changing dates um, and some personnel. 
but um, we'd like to allow you to talk or hear from our high school administration about some of the changes that they would like to see in the uh, GHS handbook. And they actually brought some um, show and tell it's items. Project. Yeah, it won't be too surprised. Old school, I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> And wanted Mr. Wolf to feel right at home with Thank this you. next presentation. Um, Scott's going to set something up here that is going to really illustrate the point that we're trying to make with one of the changes that we would like to see happen um, in the handbook as it relates to substance abuse and tobacco abuse policies. Um, so in their current state, um, they exist separate or independent of one another. So you have a tobacco use policy, you have a substance use policy. Tobacco includes um, all things tobacco, uh, nicotine related. Um, it includes e-cigarettes. It does not include e-cigarette paraphernalia. Substance abuse um, is the catch-all for, it's at all, it's everything else. Um, so if you have um, confiscated marijuana, um, cocaine, mushrooms, alcohol, anything along those lines, um, those things are handled really in two separate buckets. Um, what you see here um, on the far right side is what we have confiscated in relation to specifically tobacco. Now this is from this year. Um, everything else that you see in the middle and on the lower right hand side, it's all been confiscated this year related to the use of e-cigarettes and specifically um, the device called the Juul. Um, we've done some parent education about the Juul um, and the prevalence of it. Um, any of the students sitting in the audience um, either have seen it, they know someone who's currently doing it. Um, we had a staff meeting where we, uh, we put five uh, Juuls in the hands of staff members um, and they mimicked the uh, movement of bringing the jewel from their pocket or from their pocket to their mouth during the staff meeting. Um, and no one was any the wiser at the end of about 20 minutes of conversation about it. Um, they're very discreet. They're very easy to conceal. And uh, I don't feel like I'm being alarmist or dramatic when I say that they are terribly, terribly deadly. Um, we have no idea what's coming uh, from the jewel. Again, not being dramatic, not being alarmist. Well, when cigarettes hit the market, how many years ago? Five or 10 years in, no one understood the danger that was inherent in the use. Um, and I believe that we're seeing uh, the next generation of that. Um, the, the head nods from the students um, that, are, that are in the crowd with us are confirming um, our belief. It, it is an issue. So we want to address things in a very different way um, at the high school. And we want to push tobacco use and substance use policies together. Um, we need to treat nicotine um, as a very serious, serious issue um, because what we're seeing is a generation of students who is going to be um, dependent on nicotine um, for the duration of their lives, in my opinion. Um, we have no idea what they're inhaling as it relates to uh, the, medical, the metal particles um, as these jewels heat up and as they're used. Um, this is a very unknown area. Um, and so I, I really feel like we need to be um, at the forefront with this um, in modifying the way that we do some things at the high school. Um, and so what you have, um, I believe Jeff has sent to you um, about two, two and a half weeks ago, um, was the idea that we have of pushing these policies together. Um, I know that the board has an orientation uh, towards in-school suspension, um, and we respect and we agree with that uh, philosophy. Um, and so whereas substance abuse, a first offense would be 10 days out of school. Um, we actually want to push these things together and we want to reduce the suspension, uh, but we want to keep them in school. We want to emphasize the education component as well. Um, and we also want to start to, students forgive the, the language here, but we want, we want to hit them where it hurts. Uh, an out of school suspension, um, depending on parental support, can be a vacation for a student. And that's just me being honest with you. Um, but if we start to move into things like the reduction um, or the loss of privileges, um, think of the ability to park on school grounds. Think of the ability for someone to go on campus for lunch. The use of late arrival or early dismissal. If we start moving into things that actually mean something for a student, I believe that we will get more attention from the student. Um, and I think that we'll start to see the students respect the school grounds and respect the school uh, activities 
um, by not bringing these things. Uh, we cannot control uh, what they do, obviously, outside of the time that we're with us. Um, but hopefully through education um, and through some policy, adjust policy adjustments, we can move the needle um, on this issue. Um, it's one that we're seeing um, more and more uh, each year. I would say five to six years ago, Ryan, was when the probably the first time that we saw an electronic cigarette um, in the high school. Uh, and our policy at that time did not even include electronic cigarettes. Um, they were novel, they were new, they were trendy. Um, so we, we rewrote some policy to include those things. Um, but again, to be perfectly honest with you, we had um, a student who was found in possession of empty jewel pods, um, and we could not assign any punishment because a jewel pod <coughs> in that Ziploc baggie um, essentially is an empty plastic container. And if there's nothing in it, then it, it can't be used for anything in that state. Um, so we found ourselves in a very similar situation to where we were six years ago where, try as I might, as much as I wanted to, um, I could do nothing more than a phone call home to inform the people of, of what we found, uh, make sure that they understood, but then in terms of school discipline, um, we were left um, without anything to do really. So that's, that's one component that, that you've seen Jeff pass along to you. The first offense, like I said, would be five days in school, um, reduced to three days if they pursue um, a nicotine uh, program that um, LMH has got a nice one that we have referred students to. Again, it doesn't have to be through LMH. It doesn't have to be through any specific person as long as they're receiving education. Um, we want to do our best to turn, um, hopefully, one misstep into uh, a correction rather than watch it become more of a chronic habit. Um, the second offense, uh, we would move towards that out of school suspension um, as we had done in the, in the substance abuse um, that, that currently is in, um, is in place. Um, but again, we would highlight the reduction there um, that a student could receive after you know, pursuing some education. Um, and then you're seeing just a growth um, in those consequences in the first one. Um, you see 45 days loss of lunch privileges. So Mr. Wolf is a high school senior. His parents have signed off. Um, he, he's enjoying his off-campus lunch privilege, but he is caught in violation. Um, effective the next day, it starts a 45-day clock where he doesn't leave campus for lunch. On the second offense, that grows to 90 days. Um, so it's that idea of, of elevating the consequence on a second uh, offense. Um, the third offense um, would be a, a recommendation for expulsion. That is the current second offense for substance abuse issues. Um, so again, we're, we're adding a level there, um, hopefully addressing some of those privileges um, to get the attention of the students and then reinforcing and emphasizing the educational component. Matt, just yeah. to, to clarify on, on the changes from the second offense, um, is that limited specifically to certain infractions or is, there, or is that for any violation of the substance abuse policy? Correct. So this would be, so if we push these two policies together, this would be, I was caught with a dip in my cheek, I was caught with a cigarette in my hand, I was caught with a jewel, I was caught with mushrooms. So it pushes all of these things together um, into that one thread. So a second offense for being caught with a pack of cigarettes is grounds for expulsion. No, a Sorry. second offense would be the 10 day out of school. Oh, 10 day, but a seven. third offense. A third offense, is correct. Expulsion. Correct. Can, how do those, what are the, can you step through the consequences of the current policy? In sure. Both the tobacco and the other case, just to make sure that we got sure. that right? Sure. So on the substance abuse side, there's two, there's really just two things. It's two step steps. It's a 10 day out of school suspension reduced to five with, with chemical dependency counseling. Second offense is an expulsion, recommendation for expulsion. Building principals can't expel, so it's just a recommendation of the superintendent. Um, currently, on the tobacco side, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. I want to say that it's four reduced to two for the first offense, mm -hmm. and then it grows to five reduced to three for the second offense, um, and then I believe third offense is expulsion. So you're pushing those two things together. Any other questions about that, that piece? Um, 
I, I trust your leadership and guidance on this. I think we, we really are, have the kids and the community's right interest in mind, so thank you. Um, I'm not sure what how significant this is from what resources are required from keeping the kids in school. I think that's the right thing to do, but in school suspension does have implications for how they're monitored and how they're dealt with and so forth. So could you address the resources yes. of, of that side? I think it's the right thing from a health and wellness perspective, but what do you need? Yeah, so from, a, from an in-school suspension standpoint, um, let's go back eight years. Bef before the sub pool got really, really shallow, we provided supervision uh, in the form of a substitute teacher on a daily basis for in-school suspension. As we have seen the sub pool dwindle, we've actually moved away from requiring that suspension or that, that supervision because we've got a spot in the office where we can monitor students um, throughout the day. Now, in an ideal standpoint, um, we start moving back towards um, that monitored study hall just because um, it, I prefer that model. Um, it puts a dedicated person with them all day long. Um, if Scott and I are in the office, you know, we, we have eyes on the student, but in a situation that pops up, then he and I disappear for 10 minutes and we come back. Now the student hasn't gone anywhere, but it's just the fact that there's no direct eyes on that student. Um, that's our preference. So you're talking about a sub cost per day um, to supervise in school suspension. <coughs> Help me calibrate on how many kids are in that room on a regular basis or an occasional it's, basis. Is that just kind of average or typical or? We have a student in in school suspension five days a month. Okay. It's, it's not something that's uh, an, an overly used Thank you. form of discipline. Yeah. Thank you. Matt, is there, is there or, or what is the process to, for a uh, approved education facilitator, whether it's substance abuse or smoke or tobacco? Yeah, yeah. so if you're going to move towards um, chemical dependency, if you're moving towards nicotine, those are handled in two very different ways. Um, so LMH has got their tobacco school, right. the day-long course. Um, they provide us with verification that that has been attended and completed. Um, what we've done historically with substance use, um, if there is an issue with alcohol or marijuana on campus, um, let's use LAP as the example for, for where they seek out the chemical dependency counseling. It's actually up to that person or that agency to determine what the extent of that treatment plan is. Um, that's not, not something that we weigh in on. Um, so again, Mr. Wolf might go there and they might say, you know, Mr. Wolf, it's clear you made a mistake, but it's also clear to us after two visits that you're not in need of ongoing treatment for this. So they're gonna sign off and they're gonna send us a letter that says he's good to go. At, at, that, at that time, those five days of suspension that we held in advance disappear because he's completed with satisfactory, um, you know, paperwork and documentation. Now, Ms. Deeds goes and they say, you need 15 sessions. <laughs> <laughs> and so Ms. Deeds goes to 12 and then she's kind of burned out on this whole idea. They're actually gonna give us, they're, they're gonna repeatedly communicate with her, you haven't finished, you haven't finished. They're gonna go to her parents, she hasn't finished. And then finally they're gonna come back to us and they're gonna say, unfortunately, Ms. Deeds never finished. Those five days of suspension that were held in advance are immediately applied um, to her because she didn't complete that uh, chemical dependency counseling. Well, Does that I help? it helps, okay. but I, I guess is there? Do we have an approved list of where? Great question. Great students question. can seek education and right. assistance. Right. So our language that we use is always: if you need a resource in this county, you let us know. LAP is an option. This is an option. This, but we also understand that sometimes the best first place for a parent to start is by calling their insurance provider. Okay. to figure out, hey, who do you want to work with in network that's got this certification? As long as it's a person that has that chemical dependency certification, we're good with anybody. Right. They have to carry that license. It's a great question. Very good. Okay, the next piece. Um, let's chat cell phones. The second component that we want to modify for next year um, is that we want to turn these little guys um, into less of a distraction for our students. Um, we want to mirror a policy that's similar to uh, the way that we currently handle backpacks. So we have no issue with the student bringing a backpack to school, hanging in your locker, and then see you later until the end of the school day. Now, there's, the cell phone piece looks a little different. Um, but the original reason that we allowed cell phones in classrooms was through the bring your own device, the BYOD policy. It simply stated we didn't have the technology 
to put in every student's hands. Um, and so where it was accessible, we used that um, through a Schoology app or a My Big Canvas, anybody remember My Big Canvas app as well. Um, with Chromebooks, we simply don't need them anymore. We don't need them in terms of technology access and use in the classroom. Um, so what we wanna do is we wanna to move towards a system where students bring them to school, they're welcome there, it's not a big issue, leave it in your locker just like you leave your backpack in your locker. Um, mom and dad need to get you a message. No worries, our periods are only 50 minutes long, so you can check your locker at the end of the first period, check it at the end of the second period. Um, at lunchtime, take it with you to the lunchroom, no issue whatsoever, but then make sure it gets back in your locker, you know, when you head to sixth or seventh period, finish out your day, um, and then obviously you have access to it after that point for transportation and those things, um, you know, after school. Um, we would make obvious exceptions for things like medical situations. Uh, we do have diabetics in our district that use an app on their cell phones to help monitor their levels. So that's a no-brainer for us. We would make exceptions for those types of situations. Um, we've tried to look at this through the lens of a parent. Um, I've got an urgent pressing issue. Um, I don't have access to my student via their cell phone. What do I do now? Um, call the main office, we send a runner up, um, and we let the student know that they need to call their parent immediately. Um, so it, you're, you're really not seeing too much of a delay there in the communication. Um, not all of the cell phones have service um, in the buildings. Uh, we are famously um, misunderstood throughout this county as having some type of a cell phone blocker <laughs> in our buildings, um, which the FCC strictly prohibits. Um, so to go on record now, uh, we don't have cell phone blockers, we just have geography and metal roofs in our favor. <laughs> and so we, you know, there are legitimately sometimes when Verizon, for example, does not get any service um, at the high school. Um, and so all the Verizon users just walk in and they know that they're not gonna have any luck with that. Um, so we, we wanna move that direction. Um, any questions or, or thoughts on the cell phone piece? Is it the high school only or the middle school? So that's a curious question. Um, Lisa Ormond and I have talked um, extensively about this, so I know that this would be 712. Um, I do know that at the younger levels, um, they would appreciate the expansion of this policy uh, to include them as well um, because students are getting cell phones earlier and earlier in their lives um, and so this would actually be an, it would be a nice thing to just apply across the district can you speak to what the what the challenges are with cell phones and what are we trying to address here yeah that's a great question russ um i would love it if you i'll send you the link after after i get done um, there is a great 13 minute anderson cooper um, interview with a guy named Tristan Harris. He's, he's a former Silicon Valley um, app developer. 13 minute video, um, and he will walk you through exactly uh, what our concerns are. Um, to be specific, um, app developers um, are very, very savvy, and they know neuroscience, and they know behavior modification and manipulation. Um, and so they are literally hacking the brains um, to use Tristan Harris's words, they're hacking the brains of smartphone users because they want to pattern their behavior to, to come back for more because that's where the advertising dollars um, are realized for these companies. And so it's no secret that notifications and push notifications are as popular as they are. Um, it's no secret that Snapchat created streaks to bring students back because they don't want their streak to end. And so I've got to send someone a snap every day because I don't want my streak to end. They're geniuses and they're really, really good at what they do. And so they're manipulating us, uh, smartphone users, um, in a way that brings us back to our phones. Um, there are academic studies now that point to lower test scores. Simply, I could turn this thing off and simply with it sitting there, because I, I know it's there and I'm wondering who is trying to communicate with me, that my test scores are lower than Miss Deeds if she tests without this device on her person or near her. They, they are stealing the attention um, of our culture. And I think that we owe it to our students to give them a 48, 49 minute break um, throughout the course of the class period. 
Um, it's something that's very close to my heart. Um, and it's, you know, I, I, for better or worse, my poor kids have will, will now benefit or not benefit from everything that I have seen um, in the high school. Um, and so they won't have a mobile device in their room. Um, they will have electronics restrictions because these things um, are literally changing the way that we do things in society. Again, not alarmist, not early dramatic, just very factual. Um, they're changing the way that our brains work. Slot machines are programmed the exact same way. It's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing, and then it's a little bit, and then it's a lot, and now I'm hooked. <clears throat> and Instagram does it the same way. They hold back on your notifications, they hold back, and then there's a flurry of them. And so you're just hooked right in. I mean, these guys are geniuses, and they know exactly what they're doing. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so, talk to us about enforcement. How, how, <laughs> it's easy to see a student who walks in with a backpack on. It is. Right? How are you going to, how, yeah. how are the staff going to deal with this and use of staff time and interruption in the classroom? How's that going to be managed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's why we have given concessions with lunch, honestly. Mm -hmm because we don't have the staffing to, to police this in a lunchroom. Um, when you've got 400 students sitting there eating lunch, it's an impossibility to think that we can try to supervise and police um, that type of thing. Now, in the classroom, it's different. Um, and it's not gonna be a tremendous adjustment for our classroom teachers because past practice was, if the teacher says don't bring it or don't use it, then it shouldn't be out. So they'll still need to, to manage that in the classroom environment. But I, I really see this in large part a lot like backpacks. Um, the first nine weeks, it was difficult. But then once people get into the flow of the, the way the new norm is, then that newness starts to wear off and so that learning curve really drops. Um, what we wanna do is we actually wanna approach this um, at the building level rather than at the classroom level. Um, because again, in the spirit of, of hit them where it hurts, and I hate to, I, again, I, I, forgive me for using that language, but if this starts to be the most important thing for a student and this thing starts to disappear on a regular basis, then they will modify their behavior. They will, because they like these. Um, I sat down and talked with a small group of juniors about this because the juniors are the ones that are gonna carry this torch. Um, and they had great, great, great questions. And it was actually in those conversations where I think Scott and I began to understand you know what, we, get, we should let them have it at lunch. We should. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a compromise. Um, it's a supervision issue. So let's, let's let, them, let them have it at lunch. Um, and it's, it's a little bit of a way to almost keep the peace, if you will, um, when you bring something in like this. One of the things that I learned, especially from these two in the front this year, um, and we had a lot of good conversations about um, the application of rules and policy or are people working with mutual respect in a mutual respect environment? Um, and so if we can move towards uh, continuing that mutual respect environment, students are not gonna be happy with this new rule. They're not. But if we can point to concessions like, you get it at lunch and you can check it every 50 minutes, then that does, it decreases uh, that, that mountain climb that they're gonna make um, in the way to shift with this policy. Um, one of the things that we have gone back and forth on, and we had great conversation about this, J.R. Waite, to his credit, is the first one that mentioned this. What happens in that severe, tragic situation? But we settled on this. It, God forbid it ever happened. But in a situation where, where um, something like an active shooter is taking place, I don't want a student distracted by this. I want a student attentive and focused on me as a classroom teacher. Because we're making the call as to whether or not we should evacuate, whether we should stay. Okay, this is very flight or fright. And I don't want them distracted by this in that key second. I want them eyes on me doing exactly what we're deciding to do. I put myself in a parent's shoes. And I think of an hour has passed, you know, since some situation has happened in the building. Now it's two hours. I think of that anxiety and that panic. And I'm not comparing these things apple to apples, but I am gonna make a comparison with the anxiety that our students feel. Watch that video. The anxiety that our students feel because of these things. 
And I sincerely think that there's a very, very comparable point there. And our preference would be, let's address what we know is currently happening in the way of anxiety, rather than something that could possibly happen down the road, but we hope never does. Um, this, this has been the source of many, many good conversations um, in the high school. Um, so I, I bring this to you with a lot of confidence, but I also bring this to you um, with an understanding that you have to make your own decision for it. I have a couple of questions. I've talked to a number of students as well about <coughs> cell phones in general, and, and there is some justification for real useful things that they can do with the cell phone in the classroom that is maybe different than a Chromebook. Although they have Chromebooks, Agreed. you know, you need to yeah. pull out a calculator real quick. Well, a cell phone works for that. You need to, you know, check Schoology to see if an assignment's in. It's a lot easier to, like, use your cell phone than, like, take your Chromebook and open it up if it's not running and so forth. Like, what do you think about uh, useful things that yeah. kids can do by bringing their own devices? Mike Bade is a great example. Mike has created um, a system in his physics and astronomy classes where kids actually capture videos mm -hmm. with cell phones. And so Mike is kind of going back to the drawing board going, can I make a Chromebook work? Or there's no reason that Mike can't say, for the next five days, you guys can bring this to my class. A, a teacher would have the availability to do that um, just like a student walking through the high school with crutches. They've got a backpack on their back. We make common sense exceptions for those types of situations. Now, if I can check a Schoology assignment in 10 seconds here, or I can check it in 60 seconds here on my Chromebook, I'm good with the 50 second lag. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing I'd love to get your insights on yes. is I think these things are here to stay. Right, and I think living amongst technology is something that we all need to deal with, right? And whether you're like in a classroom with the distraction of it, or in a meeting like this, where I've seen a number of people with phones out and things like that, including I've probably got one around here too, right? So there's an opportunity that for that, and I think that like a real, real important thing we need to educate our kids on as a society is how to live amongst <coughs> technology, yeah. right? And, and be able to have a cell phone <coughs> person and not be dedicated to it. And I, I don't know that we need to put that full responsibility on classroom teachers, right? But I think that we need to think seriously as a society, like how do we live amongst this technology, right? Yeah. And is, is banning it the right thing, right? Or is that maybe just deflecting the problem to some other time or some other, you know, whether the, when they go to way to college, they don't know how to be confident with sure. their cell phone in the classroom or whether they go home and so forth. So like, Again, I don't know if that's the classroom teacher's responsibility, but like it's coming, yeah. right? And yeah. I think that you know finding a way to deal with it and manage it is a really worthy goal for us. Yeah, I, I, I would I would use myself as an example. Um, I just finished my fourth year as the principal of the high school. Um, in the first year, um, I took email to my phone. Okay, smartphone user, I'm going to stay on top of my email, and so I'm going to I'm going to have my email connected to my phone. By November of my first year, I shut it off. Mm -hmm. Couldn't do it. Yeah. Couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just said no to it. Now, when my kids grow older and they've got a cell phone, um, they will never have it in their room. Okay, mm -hmm. That's me providing boundaries for them to dictate their behavior. I think as a parent, I can dictate their behavior and hope to create habits for them. If they understand that they're distracted with this, then either turn it off or push it to the side. Because there's no managing push notifications. They're either on or they're off. So if my phone is on and I'm doing my academic work and my notifications are on, I'm guaranteeing myself that I'm going to be distracted during that work session. So what do I do as an intelligent person? I either turn it off, I turn off my notifications. I mean, to, to me, we can teach them how to use these things in a healthy way. We can teach ourselves how to use these things in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. I, would throw, I would be the first one to throw myself under the bus when it relates to being distracted around my kids. And I know that when I just set it down and walk away from it, I'm better as a dad because I'm more attentive to my kids. If I've got this thing in my pocket and I get a text, you better believe I'm going to be breaking my attention from my kids, checking my message, and then coming back to them. So for me, how I manage this is I either have it near me or I don't have it near me. And that's that's as sophisticated as I get. Now, that doesn't mean everybody has to follow my rules, um, but I, I, don't, I don't see us, these guys are too smart, I don't see us
turning down a distraction that this thing beeps in my pocket. If we're having this conversation and I get nothing but vibrating on this pocket because people are blowing me up, I'm lucky that Bait and Mr. Hopping aren't blowing up my phone right now. Just to make it <laughs> <laughs> Look at Jeremy's phone, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thing open. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hopping is one of the last few who yeah. hasn't gone over to, yeah. the, to the smartphone. Yeah. And look yeah. how happy he is. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, there's no doubt it's going to become more prolific and more integrated. I mean, just the transition from kind of laptops and desktops to, you know, tablets and phones and like sure. watches. Are we going to eliminate watches too? How about glasses when those come out? Like, sure. I think it's a natural, it's an evolution, whether it's natural or not, it's unavoidable. Right, and I think the educational component of being able to deal with it, yeah. right, and having the wisdom as a high schooler to put it in your pocket, yeah. right, you know, is, is an important lesson, right? And again, I'm not sure it necessarily needs to be on school teachers, but kids are in school a lot. And, yeah. and, and you know, I see a lot of people that are sort of dysfunctional adults right now because they have their phones at dinner and they're sitting right across from somebody, right, and they're not paying attention to the people that they're with and around, right? Yeah. I don't know that technology is evil or bad, right? No. It's just thing. You know, it's changing us. It's changing technology our mental processes. It's Absolutely. changing the way that we deal with each other in the world, right? And it's it's a thing that's happening that I, I'm I'm worried if we try to segregate it by just saying, oh, leave it in your locker, then everything will be fine, right? I, I'm not sure. So let's ex so let's ex saying, what, Go ahead. We're, what we're saying is that for the 45 minutes or an hour the longer in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be focusing on your education. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't see that not having your cell phone with you. Well, I, yeah, I know. I mean, I, I think there are valid things that kids can do with cell phones in the classroom, right? And I, you know, and, and whether but they be small little tools about checking things or calculators and stuff. Cell phones in the classroom. And I think that's good. We need to have that latitude, certainly for staff. And if there's an issue, you know, with that, like maybe we need to have a rack by the door or we need to have something like that. Where you know it's it's clear that you know our policy is if the teacher wants you to put the phone in the back of the door, you're doing the way in, or or how you police if it's used in an inappropriate way or if it's used in a way that's distracting to the classroom experience or whatever, how you manage through that. But I think it's like an increasingly um, important thing societally we figure out how to deal with. Yeah. Well, one one thing I'd like to bring up though, and I believe that the district supports it. The, I know the community does. I mean, GRD sponsors turn off your screen week, and there's mm -hmm. and there is support across the community for one week to stop mm -hmm. using your devices. Um, mm -hmm. And I tend to agree with Amy that for 45 minutes, I, I would I, I would hope that the student is nothing but focused on. On their schoolwork and what the teacher is, is teaching, and and some some students are going to be able to ignore the phone, and others aren't. So, any other questions? Matt, what do you what do you do? How will you assess whether it becomes a persistent problem in enforcement? You know, if, if yeah. Mr. Hopping says, look, every third day, I'm sending five kids back to their lockers to take their phones, and it goes on and goes on and goes on, and the only consequence of bringing your phone to the classroom is you get sent back to your locker. Right. What are you going to do then? Yeah. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so we would, we would grow that consequence. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, if, if Nick Maxwell walks in to uh, his English class and he has his phone in his pocket and it never leaves his pocket and he never touches it during the class period, it's a non-issue. I mean, I'm just frankly speaking, we're not having kids open their pockets when they walk in, you know, English rooms. We're, if it's never out, it's never an issue, okay? Now, eventually the norm will become leave it in your locker, leave it in your locker. But you're gonna have those students that hang on, right? You're gonna have next year's seniors who hang on and they're fighting the good fight. And I put it, it was in my class every single, it was in my pocket every day and they never caught me with it. Well, okay, that's fine. As long as it's not out distracting you, um, then we'll live with that. Now, if a student violates misdeeds, um, <laughs> she's always in trouble. Amy, you are in trouble. <laughs> she's just so close. Um, if, you know, if misdeeds come to class and she has that phone out, um, then the teacher's gonna ask her to leave it in, in the teacher's room uh, for the day. Misdeeds, turn your phone off, put it on my desk, come back at 2.50. If it's a one-time situation, then that's okay. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Um, there's gonna be a situation where a kid forgets that he has his phone in his pocket because it's a part of him. Um, and so that's going to happen. If it's chronic, 
then we move to things like a phone call home and the next time only the parent can pick it up. And then if it happens again, then it sits in Mr. Carpenter or my office until the parent can come pick it up. Now, we've had that happen on a couple situations and we've had two different reactions. I can't believe you're inconveniencing me. And you know what? If this is the third time and they still have their phone out, I'm not sure I can make it in to get that phone for four days. And we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you've got to kind of massage that a little bit and see how that situation goes. But um, we, just, we believe in progressive discipline. And if it's the first offense, it's, we're not going to make the, the end of the world out of it. Um, but we'll progressively move it to a little bit higher stakes. So this would actually not just be a, a handbook policy change, but then we, it would change the BYOD. Um, you would have two policy changes. Yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. Bring your which, own device. Which, yeah. Bring your own device. Which, which really needs to change based on the Chromebook, which need to change anyway. Yeah. So, sorry, so it would be the handbook would. And, and then also board policy. Correct. Okay. What else do you want to tell us? That's all I got, guys. That's it? That's all I got. No. Anything else for me? Um, a few more comments or questions? Look, I, you know, I, I, I agree with Thomas. There's no putting the genie back in the bottle here. Right. Um, and, and ultimately, we all have to learn how to manage the technology or it manages us. Yeah. But I understand what you're saying about the distraction. I was concerned, as you know, about the safety issue. Sure. If you feel confident that, that you can address that issue. Yeah. Um, you know that that goes a long way. Um, and, and I don't want the enforcement to become a bigger distraction than the phone. We agree. That's a concern. Yep. So to to, to finish answering that that bit of the question, you know, if Jeremy and Mike Day come to me after nine weeks and they go, "Man, we are not making many headroads on this," then we sit down and we reevaluate it. But um, I, I don't. I don't think that our staff is going to flinch by some enforcement um, that they have to take care of um, as we, you know, embark on a new policy. Um, they're they're on board. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, have, I have confidence in, in the judgment and ability to um, impart whatever uh, consequence needs to happen in order to, uh, to enforce the policy. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hannah and Noah, sorry that was longer. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> so as Hannah and Noah get set up, um, I'd like to, uh, Noah just graduated and Hannah is a junior, senior now? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, so an incoming senior. They are going to talk to you about a project that they've been working on related to the land lab and um, you know, one of the things that we've emphasized from a project-based learning perspective or a take action project or a legacy project is that public product, that public presentation of um, information about what they've learned and what they're trying to do. And so this is one more example of students taking on a project and uh, trying to get it to fruition. So Hannah Sturgeon and Noah King. Okay, so this past year, our Take Action project with Mr. Redding's eighth period AP and bio class was to build an observational deck at um, the land lab at the intermediate school. Um, so our main goal with this, um, the observation or the land lab already does an excellent job of providing to both elementary schoolers, intermediate schoolers, and high schoolers. Yeah. And it's been a great asset to us, but it's not accommodating to everyone in our community, specifically um, older or disabled or handicapped people who can't enjoy the trails and can't get like really into the nature that is provided with the land lab. Yeah, so our goal with this would just be um, to open it um, up even more to the community and make it um, even more a useful like, learning experience for students as well. So as Hannah already mentioned, we worked with uh, Mr. Redding and AP Environmental Science to uh, do this project. Um, the students involved were Kinsey Chesnaron, Rachel Lilly, Sean Bossart, Brielle Bate, Charlie Fink, Nate Miller, Joe Rapp, Justin Carson, 
Jacob Massa, Alexi McFarland, Kristen Vanel, Hannah Sturgeon, and Grant Bibler. So, um, we first what we did is we sent out an email to multiple different contractors that we know have relations with Granville students. Um, we I know we emailed Terra Nova, which is the one we ended up partnering with, um, Galoni Builders, and I think there was one more. Um, Petron. Yeah. So we ended up um, building a relationship with Terra Nova, and we had several meetings with them. Um, I got to sit down with uh, Rachel Lilly at a meeting where we drew out de different deck designs with the architect, and then we had another meeting at the land lab where we met with them in the location we wanted to build. Um, they took pictures, and then they sent us back digital designs of the deck that we had decided on. Um, we're also partnering with U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, and Brett Sonnergren and uh, several private community members who are willing to donate costs which we can't cover. So there's really a lot of um, excitement with this project because um, it can just really further the accessibility of the land lab and get more people out there and uh, further the idea of land stewardship that Mr. Redding tries to teach us in AP Envir Environmental. Um, so this is like when we went out and took pictures, this was the digital deck design they sent us back. It would be, um, this would be, that's like an aerial picture of the land lab. It would be on the, um, it would be on a hill that's close to, it's on the right side if you're pulling into the intermediate school. And it's overlooking, like down here is our biggest wetland in the um, land lab. And so that would be, we would want it to overlook that land lab so you can see all of the wildlife and animals without disturbing them. So like birds that come to the land lab and fly in, we want you to be able to look at them and observe them from far away without disturbing them and flying, them flying away. So um, something we did this year with our huge team was we were really researching different ways to get grants and fund this because we knew it was gonna be, be a beast to fund. So what we were finding is um, not a lot of the grants uh, would um, fund us for just a construction project. It had to have a clear educational component so what we came up with, um, some of the students were designing inf informational graphics, and this is a, a sample. We already have some design, but um, Mr. Redding wants um, some of the more artistic students to get involved with like hand drawings too, um, because Riel Bate was involved with our project and did an excellent job with uh, the graphics. Um, we already have IP kiosks built, so it would just be a matter of coming up with a final design getting a nice quality print of it, and then framing them and setting the kiosks up at the finished deck. Um, yeah, so like Noah mentioned, we did have a lot of like problems when looking at grants because grants, a lot of grants specifically stated, like the bigger grants we wanted to apply for, specifically stated that they didn't want to fund building of any decks, and some of them even said specifically wetland decks. So what we decided to do, <laughs> <laughs> so what we decided to do is kind of take it on more of like, okay, let's find a way to get this deck funded and built, and then use grants to implant more educational things such as spotting scopes, and like maybe even like another project in this for future classes could be solar panels. Um, so we kind of took the grants in more of a way of what more can we add than just having this deck. So the final estimate that we came up with when we were working with David Johnson, our architect, Todd Willis, an engineer, and um, the service desk at Home Depot, and additionally, Mr. Nazari and Mr. Reed, the Terra Nova builders who we were in contact with the entire project. Um, the final dollar was 15,200, um, and that comes with the best materials we can come up with, um, while still remaining within a reasonable budget, but um, the least amount of maintenance. Um, yeah, so our we organization that want, were willing to partner with us was, um, at the end of the year, I went out and presented um, our idea to some members of US Fish and Wildlife Services and some other few fish, um, OSU field biologists. And the OSU Fish and Wildlife Services really like took our idea to heart. And um, I think they emailed several different people the night after that presentation. And within one night, they had three organ or two organizations and one private donor um, organized and willing to cover all costs that we couldn't cover by ourselves. So I'm very happy. Um, additionally, we already managed to secure some funding this year. 
Um, as mentioned previously, uh, Brielle Bay helped with our art, and this is the poster that she entered in the Licking County Soil and Water Conservation District River Roundup uh, poster design contest. So she won $500 for us um, through that. We also um, met up with the Rotary and the Kiwanis Clubs. The Kiwanis already offered to fund, I think, $500 or $400 for us. So as this project continues to evolve, it's not like we're, we're not just like stopping here with small donors. We're going to try and continue to get small donors um, who are willing to provide money and not just leave the three major donors to cover all costs. So the timeline of this project, um, we should be able to secure the funding and get this built by the start of school year in 2018. Um, this would also require the relocation of the storage shed, which was built by the industrial tech um, classes. And I think that they want to relocate it to be closer to where um, we'll be building our deck. If, is that right? Yeah, that's accurate. OK, just checking. <laughs> Oh, and then also, can we go back to um, the back? So there, there is a sidewalk that's already extended from the school building, but it would stop. It like cuts off before we want to build our deck. So another thing we would like to add is that kind of that trunk that kind of goes like sideways to the deck to allow it to be even more wheelchair accessible. Is that included in the fifteen thousand two hundred? No, that wouldn't be. That's just kind of something we thought could be like another project, like if another year wants to pick it up. So like uh, the wetland observation deck, that's the 15,200, which will be finished by the start of this year. And then everything else is just additional things that next year gotcha. the Enviro students can work on. And Hannah, do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, I already talked to Mr. Redding before the school year ended about how like I get to spend another year here, so I talked to him about being willing to either take this up with another class if another class is willing to work on this project, or even do it individually as maybe an independent study. But I would like to see this project through to the end. Uh, any questions? Um, uh, fantastic. I, I think one of the sort of constraints with use of the land lab is there's not as much accessibility. So I think this is a great step. Is the deck big enough for a classroom yes. effectively? Yeah, that That's the goal? That's great. Right? I think if we can get that connection more clean to the intermediate school, I think it will just facilitate you know, staff going out and being more regular users of it as opposed to having to get the boots on and do all the other stuff, which is a wonderful experience as well. But the more we can make it accessible, the better. That's fantastic. And when will con you, so it's going to be ready for the beginning of the 2018 school year. So when are, is construction started or is it? No. Oh, okay. We're working with towards that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this had Yeah, we've had several meetings with, we had a meeting <coughs> in, like the week after um, exams. We had a meeting with um, all of the donors in Terranova. So it's just kind of as we're going, we're setting up more meetings. Okay. So you're continuing to fundraise to try and offset some of the costs from the donors? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that will continue until um, you know, project completion? Yeah. Okay. But regardless, they will cover whatever is left, at, whatever we can't like, bridge the gap between it. I'd encourage the Rotary to step up. <laughs> you know, Andy, Wildman was, has. Andy Wildman was here. He's the president right now. So, yeah. He'll get the message. He'll get the message right, Dallas. <clears throat> I, I should probably also give the board an understanding that I've already given the green light for the project. <laughs> um, this is one of those things that uh, obviously adds significant value and uh, at no cost. At little to no cost. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'd like to talk to you offline some suggestions on how you could, I have some suggestions on how to pay for that additional sidewalk too, so. Excellent. And in the end, what, what um, materials did you decide on for the deck, just out of curiosity? Um, composite wood, I believe, and then um, aluminum for railings. Mm -hmm. I think this is tremendous. Yeah. 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 I tell you, the land lab, year after year, comes up with the most innovative, thoughtful, challenging projects. And you and your colleagues, you lean into it every time. 
and you, you set a goal and you go and accomplish it and it makes makes us all proud. Um, what you've done is, is fantastic. And um, if Mr. Brown hadn't said yes, he would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we. So thank you for what you've done. The, and the one thing that I love that I'm I'm seeing, you know, consistently happen with kids going through and, and take and doing these take action projects is they understand project management afterwards mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you that's what the world is all about is about coalescing a group of like-minded individuals to accomplish a goal and and it's all about that project management and getting executing on all levels and so getting that experience in your k-12 experience will only help you when you go into higher ed and, and pursue whatever your passion is. But I think it's, it's a, a great learning activity. And, and you know, when, when the board created or the willingness to accept the land lab, uh, it was really with the intent that it would become an educational resource. And it has, like Mr. Janice has said, it continues to evolve um, at a whole new level. We've talked about B apiaries to decks. It's awesome. Now, Mr. Red, I'm just forewarning you, Mr. Redding is also has a chicken coop somewhere, you know, on the radar, so be careful. <laughs> uh, that's all I'm saying. Be careful. Yeah, so. Stick with the <laughs> all right. Thank well, you, thank you very much. Thank Great you. job. Thank you. All right. Mr. Sobel is up with Pay to Participate. Uh, as I referenced earlier in our discussion, the board is going to discuss um, pay to participate levels. Uh, you are not um, voting tonight on an item related to this. That, that will be held for your July meeting. But um, we wanted to have an open discussion about the implications and the decisions that you'll have to make. Thank you. Mr. Sobel. Okay. It's a very short presentation. Good. Um, <laughs> Did that come out? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, most of what I do is, is just giving some background information um, and just costing out a couple of different options um, that might be available. Um, if you take a look at what we currently have in place at the middle school and at the high school, our activity fees, um, $50 per year at the high school, $30 at the middle school, and that raises about $49,000 annually uh, from, from the current fees. Um, taking a look at um, extracurricular usage, and this is all from the 16-17 school year. The final, the final information for this school year is not all in the system yet, um, so I wanted to use a complete year when I was doing this. I can't imagine it changes much from year to year. Um, so if you look at the 16-17 school year, there were a total of almost 1,700 individual registrations for extracurricular activity. Um, about 1,100 of those were athletic, about 600 of those were non-athletic. Um, so just to get an idea of where, of where this comes from, this is not 1,600, 1,700 different kids. First of all, we don't have 1,700 kids in the middle school and the high school combined. So you do have multiple usage by by the same kids. And one thing I do want to find out with athletics is of the 1,100 or so athletes, about 257 of those were in the sports that we provide at the middle school. This would not include the sports that the GRD runs separately from us. So these are the sports that we provide. Mike, excuse yeah. me. That, am I correct that's currently 11 sports in middle school that are school yes. supported? Yeah. Yes. That middle school level? Yes. Okay, um, taking a look at what we spent on supplemental salaries during the 16-17 school year, um, we spent about $477,000 on extracurricular. This would be salaries plus salary-driven benefits. Um, we don't allocate any medical expenses to this. This would just be um, salaries plus either SIRS or SIRS, Medicare and workers' compensation. Um, of the 477,000, about 350,000 of that is athletic, about 128,000 of it is academic. 
Um, the one thing that was interesting up here doing this is of the 128,000 or so of non-athletic um, supplementals that we do pay, only about 17,500 was at the middle school um, in the non-academic side. And the fees actually, that's about the same amount of money that the fees raise right now. So, so in reality, the, the, acti the activity fees we are charging at the middle school are pretty much covering the cost of the non-athletic portion of the, the act extracurricular activities. And this actually you'll see comes into our thinking a little bit later on as, as we're thinking about how to design what a pay to participate should look like. Um, and again, of the $350,000 in athletic costs, about 64,000 of that is at the middle school. Mike, um, in the funding form, from our previous meeting, we talked about extracurricular costs. Why would those numbers maybe not quite jive with this, or do I just not remember those that budget list you had before? I had a number in mind that was higher than 477 from the athletic extracurriculars in the presentation before. There may have been some non-salary stuff. Right. I, I'd ask yeah, this is just salaries and benefits, salaries. not this total just expenditures. Yeah, yeah. We don't have a lot of non-salary stuff that comes out of the operating budget. There is a little bit. Um, because how much was that number before? I thought it was I'd have, to, I'd have to go back and, and double check. Yeah. Okay. It was yeah. over 700,000. It was 700. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Oh, I know. Yeah. This does not count, like, the, including that 700,000. Oh, athletic our, director. The athletic director. Okay. Thank the you. athletic director, secretary. Right. Um, yep. There, there are certain things. Department that are, fees. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned that the, that the $30 fee at the GMS right now is covering the non-athletic part of the, um, of the costs. So doubling, again, and now I'm just trying to give you an idea of just what cost things will raise. Um, doubling the activity fee to $100 at the high school would raise about $31,000 annually. Um, obviously, if you had a 50% increase to $75, it would generate half of that, about $15,500. Um, looking at how you charge an activity or a, an activity fee and or athletic pay to participate fee, um, you can do it as a flat amount per sport. You can do it at a declining rate where it's X for the first sport and Y just less than X for the second sport and the Z that's less than Y if you want to go that that way for a third sport, um, or you can just have a flat per fee or per sport fee. Um, that, you know, what we're talking about, the charge could be the same regardless of the sport, which is what we would recommend if you're doing that. Um, keep in mind the estimates that we have, none of the estimates have a per student or per family maximum unless that is specifically designed in the different options that we've given. So what we have here are six different options um, for, di for implementing the fees. The first four are just flat um, per sport fees. Again, ranging from 200 to $275. You can see the dollar amounts associated with them. The bottom two are a tiered fee with a higher charge for the first sport than the second sport, and those assume no, no charge for any sport beyond two. Um, there is not that maximum on the straight per, on the flat per sport cost that assumes if somebody's playing three sports, they would pay three, three fees. Um, the implementation, if we do this, um, one of the nice things about the new final form software that we're moving to, um, which has both student registration and um, other types of things, is we can implement this whole thing through um, final forms, including the payment of the fee. So it will be one stop where the parent would go in, they'd register the kid for whatever sport it is, they would pay the fee right there along with it. Um, the software does, if we decide we do want to put a family maximum, because Final Forms has a family-based unit as a component of it, um, they can implement and say, okay, it can't be more than $1,000 per family, um, or you know, whatever that number is, and they can put that that can all be built right into the final form system for administration. 
um, so we'll make it we'll make it a little bit easier. Um, it's hard to, to justify raising the middle school activity fee in this scenario. Um, if we're talking about a pay to participate driven strictly by sports, if you pull the sports out of the middle school, then what you're left with is strictly a um, um, a fee that's already generating what the cost of that program is. So there's no real justification for raising that fee. Um, Jeff and I have gone around and around on this um, many times. Um, what we are recommending um, would be to double the high school activity fee and implement a fee of $250 per sport, a flat fee, um, regardless of the sport, but with a family maximum of $1,000 so that in a large you know, family with several kids at the middle and high school level, um, it would it would put just an out of pocket maximum for them. Um, that would raise an amount of money. Yeah, we're, we've been looking to try and raise an amount of money in the upwards of $175,000. This will come close to that. I think it's a little bit, I think it's a little close to 170, even if it is 175 um, as a prediction. Um, but it, it would generate about the amount of revenue that we would have targeted for um, this piece of the, the solution from the budget production. And that's really about. I just want to give you just some background on stats and some cost out. Yeah, some cost options. Um, I think we'll have some discussion of this now or during board discussion. Um, this will be something that we would anticipate coming back on at the July meeting um, to adopt something to put in place for the upcoming school year. Mike, would would you mind going back one screen, please? Thanks. Um, at the middle school, the um, the fee covers most all the um, non-sports extracurriculars, academic extracurriculars. Yes. At the high school, how does the new fee propose relate to the cost of our non-athletic extracurriculars? It would it would cover uh, probably a little bit less than half. So if we were generating. With what it generates now, we'd be generating sixty-two thousand dollars. And if we back up here, a couple of slides. One twenty-seven. Um, we have about one hundred ten thousand oh. dollars as the the cost at the you know at the high school right now for non-active, non-athletic extracurriculars. So it's going to cover just a, maybe about sixty percent. Right. And how much revenue is raised by the Per sport athletic fees specifically, this this overall raises. That was good. I one. So well, if we think you recommend it was one hundred thirty six thousand. Right, and then we would raise thirty one thousand from the. But that's not including the that, doubling just, of the. This activity. is just the. Okay. Yeah, this is just the um, right. per sport fee. Yeah, if you would add the thir the doubling of the activity, so would add thirty one thousand. So you get right. at the two fifty, you get the one sixty seven. Right. As an estimated revenue, which covers about a third of the cost of those services, maybe a fourth if you figure athletic director and everything. Um, so right, if you figure in the athletic yeah. director as well, yeah, it's less, it's less than that, but yeah. Okay. Did we? Did you consider at all a different um, level of fees for high school versus middle school sports? We did. We kick that around. Yeah, and and the cost is for athletics is pretty commensurate. So um, we felt like uh, two fifty per sport fee. We also looked at what the GRD charges mm -hmm. for the uh, athletic programs that they run, and it runs anywhere from two hundred to two fifty as well for the middle school program. Mm -hmm. At least that's what Andy reported. Yeah. So um, we felt it was. Compromise. Comparable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know, uh, just point of reference for the board, the athletic boosters work with equipment and uniforms 7 through 12. So they're now, they're in the cycle when we, we have a cycle built in every three to four years, new uniforms and thing, and, and middle school is included in that as well. So they were, the middle school program, the 11 sports, mm -hmm that are school sponsored, I guess for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. are, are always, always included with. Mm -hmm. 
booster participation. Mm -hmm. Mike, I know you built an assumption in here of some penetration rate, some amount of perhaps loss of participation. Yes. Uh, what, what was that assumption? It's 15% okay. on that. So basically on average across all the scores that it would, re it would reduce participation on average by 15%. And that's not based on any hard data we have. It's just that, is not based on, that is not based on hard data. Okay. I think it is a really good point that um, a lot of times we have students who participate in activities um, to complement some other activity that they're, they're doing for the PE waiver. Mm -hmm. um, they also do like indoor track for conditioning uh, for an additional sport that they might be involved in. Um, or sometimes they just try out for an activity late in their high school career. Um, I think this does become a, a burden that um, might prevent some of those opportunities. That, I get this. That's kind of the area I really struggle with. I've always been opposed to fees like this. And, and I, I know all of the school districts do it. I know parents will be willing to pay it because there's sort of that expectation for sports and things like that to pay it and so forth. But like I worry about that 15% of kids that are not going to participate in some way, you know. And I, you're not, you're not going to lose your stars, mm -hmm. right? They're going to get, they're going to fees going to be paid for. But the kid who decided to run track, you know, all he'd never run before, or went out for tennis, or decided to golf, or things like that, those are kinds of habits that can develop really lifelong values and things like that. And I really struggle with that. So I struggle with fees in general. But and so I wish we could find a more, a better way to raise these funds, you know, with something like an earned income tax so that it taxes the same base, <laughs> right? Um, and it effectively accomplishes the same thing one way or another, right? And it's really frustrating that we haven't been able to do that, <laughs> of course. Uh, and so maybe I'm resigned to this to some extent, but I don't, I don't, I don't know this is the right thing for the districts. So I struggle with it sort of philosophically, but I understand that this is the position that we're in. And, and I don't like it. I'm not sure what that means for going forward and you know, what the implications are and things like that, but I, you know, the recommendation seems like it's reasonable and the right one. You know, but I've always struggled with that. And I'm not like a super athletic guy. My kids are not on all kinds of sports. My kids you know, are, are academic, but certainly the value of all the extracurriculars is such an important part of the product that we offer. Right? In, in any way that that's diminished to the number of kids or the quality of the program, it's a real shame. But, you know, that being said, we, we really do pride ourselves on the balance between arts, academics, athletics, and it really is a balanced approach. Yeah. Um, you know, our music program is stellar, our athletic, uh, athletic program is stellar, our academic program is stellar, mm -hmm. and we believe that that whole picture does provide a great value proposition to parents and to the students that are being exposed to things that um, might become their thing, right? What, that they're passionate about, their niche. And I think I mean, we've had this conversation in the past in my involvement with the boosters, and boosters used to be the gravy and uh, for athletics, music, academics, and now we're more foundational. And it's changing times. And I don't think any school district wants pay to participate. I, I don't think they just put it in willy nilly. It's kind of like a last, it, to me, as far as our district's concerned, it's a last ditch effort. It's a way we have to address something. Because I'm, I'm not a big proponent of it at all. But I, I, don't, I don't know what our options are at this point. Um, and as I've stated earlier, and the boosters have stated to, to Jeff, you know, we're happy for any student that's challenged economically on this, we will help defer that. I mean, that, that's something we're committed to. And, we've, and I, I don't know, but I think I'm the only one has a, had a child that went through pay to participate. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's tough. Nobody likes writing that check. Um, so it's hard to do. I, th I think you're right about, and, there, and there's no way to really quantify it. I don't know if it'll be as high as 15, but I hate the idea of someone that wants to try something 
this the economically that come it comes into play and that that's that's really tough for me to see i don't i don't like seeing that um i have two questions but sort of along the lines of this when we're talking all the levy scenarios that we've been talking and the forums that we've been having are we making the assumption that pay to participate is going to continue indefinitely or could it possibly be a short term so the levy scenarios that we shared in the second fo funding forum did not include anything added being added back in um, those would change the ending balances mm -hmm. so the assumption was nothing was coming back on the sizing or the modeling that we did um, those could be modeled with certain things built back in or the elimination of a pay to participate fee. And they did include a pay to participate fee in the going. Yeah, they forward. did. That was, of some, that some was assumed to be permanent. Yep. Okay. No, but I'm sure there's lots of things that's Well, yeah, I know. I'm just board. curious. Yeah. So just mm -hmm. When I was reading through yeah. you know, the, the information, I just didn't know whether we, mm -hmm. you know, are, mm -hmm. are thinking about this as a short term thing or as a, as yeah. a permanent, mm -hmm. potentially permanent fee. I think a lot of that will go into the discussion on sizing of yeah. the levy request. Right. Yeah. I'd like us to consider what it might, the levy request might look like if we were to eliminate mm -hmm. yep. pay to participate, just so we know mm -hmm. what's going on. And then can you talk a little bit about the family limit? Like how did you come up with a thousand? Did you consider perhaps a athlete limit rather than a family limit? Um, and just, I'm curious as to how, and why a thousand? Well, we looked at it being, you know, if how many kids are participating in potentially three sports, mm -hmm. um, and, and then how many potentially have a sibling at that same age, age level, mm -hmm. and we felt like four sports um, would probably be um, a, a good building block, mm -hmm. and that $1,000 from a sticker standpoint um, is probably the point where I think families would really struggle beyond that part that point so it was just a kind of a gut feel mm -hmm. and a threshold standpoint okay. um, so do you think it's because then participation would drop off yes absolutely um, further yeah. if I think if a, a family had to commit more than a thousand dollars to fund the sports that that we would see potentially more than 15 percent um, so you didn't consider, could we consider an athlete limit rather than a family limit? So what would you propose? So like two, two sports, you pay for the first two sports, each, each athlete pays for the first two sports, and then the third one becomes free? Because in some ways, then, it, it's, I think that's more fair. You're not penalizing people with small families versus large families because then the people with small families disproportionately subsidize athletics for other students. We'd have to run that. Yeah. We would have to run it. Yeah. From a cost standpoint, I don't think it's going to, there weren't that many, stu there weren't that many kids who could do three sports. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were only a handful. Right. But do you see what I'm like? We could, we could yeah. bring that back in the July meeting just so that you could have that model. Mm -hmm. um, we did not consider that. We, we stuck with the family. Right. But do you see what I mean? Like yeah. why it might be sure. something to consider? Okay. Sure. That's why we have these conversations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And again, thanks for the suggestion. Thank you. You know, we're not going to fix our budget issues on pay to participate fee. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an element of what we do and we, it's we find ourselves in a position where we can and must look for revenue wherever it's available uh, understanding that again you know we can't we can't fix a significant gap in the budget uh, it's what what this allows us to do the, the number you threw out there mike of, you know call it 136 thousand dollars it allowed us when we did the reduction in force three and a half weeks ago, to um, assume that we were going to lay, uh, lay off 
your personnel than you might have otherwise. That's absolutely so right. So it's a, it's a position issue um, within our school district, which is not insignificant. So I, I think, I, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see you know some a couple of different iterations of this when we, when we talk again. Um, we certainly like to hear from folks in the community uh, about this. It, and we try to strive to get to a, a fee that is um, not onerous compared to some of the districts that we're aware of. Um, and, but it doesn't offset our costs. And I, and I would agree with the sentiment, Jim, and, you know, K-7 through 12, we want kids to be trying things. We want them to join sports. We want them to join activities. We want them to participate in clubs. We want them to participate in the arts. That, that makes them um, better students. It keeps them engaged. It keeps them attentive. It gives them a reason to be paying attention in school. It, um, it connects them. And so I think we're all reluctant to do anything to make that connection more challenging. Okay, next we're going to have a brief uh, summary of our recent uh, safety meeting with our first responders and a few community members. Hello, I uh, just wanted to recap that on April 4th, uh, we did have our safety committee meeting and um, we have a large number of people there and they reviewed the plan and they also came up with some uh, subcommittees for further research on things that we could potentially implement in the future. Um, we did submit our plan and it was approved by Homeland Security, so we are um, good to go with our new um, uh, emergency operation plan. So I'm going to provide a little bit of a uh, summary report for uh, the different groups that met and uh, what they shared with us at our last meeting, which was on June 6th. Um, the groups came back with some recommendations um, that did have a price tag um, attached to that and some came back with some a need for additional research and some things that they could go ahead and do and have an impact, for example, on mental health that would not cost any um, money to, per se. So the first group was a school resource officer group um, and they looked at what kind of an impact having a school resource officer in our school district would have. Um, they did say that they needed to gather some additional research. They felt that they needed to look at other school districts and what data that they could um, share with us to look at the impact on the school environment of having a school resource officer in the school buildings. Um, they also recognize that Granville is unique because we do not need to rely on the sheriff's office. We have our own police department here locally. Um, they talked a little bit about how we could have a variety of models um, if we were to implement a school resource officer in the buildings. We could potentially have an officer in each school building. Um, maybe we could have one that would float and kind of anything in between on what that would look like for a school resource officer. So they have some more research to do and we'll continue to monitor that. The facilities group uh, did recommend some different items that we would be considering for implementation uh, to, imp to uh, have some barricaded devices at our buildings in K-6. We do have um, some ratchet, ratchet straps, excuse me, at our um, 7 through 12 buildings that the school can use right now to barricade uh, the doors. But really the elementary, K-6, they need something that's not going to um, require strength to uh, pull those doors and hold those doors um, shut for pulling the ratchet strap. So they um, were looking at barricading devices that would cost around 8100 um, to implement again in K through six. And we do actually have money in this current year's budget to go ahead and make that happen. We also looked at providing protective barriers on the glass windows. We talked about the second floor of the high school. Um, we also talked about redoing the front entrances. Uh, we have that shatterproof coating right now on the windows. Um, so we're just looking at potentially redoing that in the future. We have a system um, for our doors. It's called our key scan system for all the exterior doors in the school buildings. Um, our system is pretty archaic and it's not, does not work properly as you probably all uh, know. So there are some updating to the system that we would need to do that would roughly cost around $18,500. Um, 
but really our doors are not secured as they should be because of the outdated system. It's also something that uh, the transportation department considered is to have cameras on buses also with a GPS system. Um, and then we also looked at having door alarms that would sound on each door. So if a door was propped open, you would hear a loud alarm so that someone would need to go and close that door. Our technology committee of one, which was Glenn, <laughs> <laughs> um, he looked at a lot of different things, um, but really came back with a recommendation of having a committee that would annually look at the security cameras at our building, um, look to see what improvements we need to make or what updates that we would need to make. So that would be something that we will look look at ongoing. Our mental health group, they um, ideally would like to have a mental health specialist um, if the levy were to pass in the 1920 school year. They also wanted to have the school counselors K through 12 really review and expand the wellness program for students. They felt this is something that they could do um, with collaboration time where they can get together and really look at the curriculum um, and provide um, a, a K through 12 wellness and mental health curriculum. They also wanted to revise the current suicide prevention curriculum and they just wanted to be an advocate for the district to create a three to five year wellness program, uh, curriculum, professional development, and some family and community education. And then our final piece was um, citizen aid. And citizen aid has public treatment kits, um, which are a vacuum sealed kit. Um, and they could go into our go buckets that we currently have. We ran a campaign, um, hopefully you saw it, and we were asking for um, parents to sponsor a kit um, to, for their classroom. And we did have approximately 16 um, kits purchased for classrooms. We were hoping for more. So we're going to run another campaign to try to um, get some additional donations in the fall. They also have wall packs that you can attach to um, the walls. Um, and we were thinking about putting those in the hallways, the same areas where our ADDs are located. So if there were an emergency life-threatening situation, we had some students that were wounded, then we would have those um, life safety kits that have some triage equipment in there that we could help with the, those um, people that may be in need of those. Um, the Citizen Aid program does align with Stop the Bleed. We've heard a lot about the Stop the Bleed um, concept and we just wanted everyone to know that, that is part of what the Citizen Aid um, kits have. So we're going to follow up, uh, continue to um, research items that were brought up. We're going to look at these revisions. Um, the counselors are really committed to do curriculum changes and improvements and we will continue to work on improving the safety in our schools. Any questions? I have several. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> thank you. Let me get um, so just sort of in order, um, on the SRO, um, you, you indicated more research is needed. I know there's there's some disparate views and mixed views mm -hmm. on the um, effectiveness potential effectiveness of SROs. So what are next steps for that subcommittee? So can I, can yes, I yes, answer? You were on the I was on the committee. Yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> what, do. when we started that conversation, I think the, the foundational assumption by some was that an SRO was absolutely necessary um, for, I would say, what they would categorize as a catastrophic event, okay, as a deterrent. Uh, what we tried to do is pull data that was related to our specific student population as far as incidents that we deal with. Um, and quite honestly, some of the things that they highlighted aren't necessarily things that we deal with as far as uh, benefits to an SRO. And um, so what we said was we need to do some deeper dives into our, our data around um, student conduct issues, those kinds of things. Um, so really, the, the rationale for the SRO is really to be that deterrent um, and for that potential ca catastrophic event versus a uh, mental health specialist that is really there as a proactive approach to 
help any potential disgruntled student or employee from ever getting to the point where that they would try and do harm. Um, so both of them had recommendations or, or suggestions of, hey, look at potential um, opportunities to hire in the future. Uh, I, I think both of those uh, areas need significant, mo significant more uh, research and review prior to ever making a recommendation because I, honestly, um, we know that we have limited dollars to work with, and um, and that you know I shared at that meeting, we're, we're in a situation where we're not spending more money right now because if we're spending more money on X, something has to change with Y. And, um, and so we're in, in the business of protecting the academic uh, performance with the understanding that we always try and take the best approach to maintain our safety and security of our students. So um, it was not a, uh, a consensus recommendation. Um, it was still a hypothetical recommendation. Um, so I wanted to be clear about that. And I know you've consulted with local law enforcement professionals and it's fair yes. to say there's no consensus there either. That's correct. Okay. Um, sec thank you. And secondly on the facilities, uh, I'm curious on the, so the barricade devices, the cape screw sticks, there's money in the budget to do that, to do that. Um, is, it, is it your sense that the, I, I wrote down ratchet straps, I don't know if that's the right name, uh, that you have at the, um, you have them at GMS and GHS. Mm -hmm. um, are those um, are those the preferred um, tool to use for, uh, for to prevent intrusion in the classroom? Is that is that um, what we should be doing, or should we be also thinking about barricade devices at, at those classrooms as well? Well, we've had recommendations from the sheriff's office to do um, the ratchet straps, and we did work with local. Um, our, our fire department here to look at those devices and, and see if they felt that those were um, adequate for us to use. Mm -hmm. And um, the recommendation I think was yes to go ahead and move forward with those. And so we, we did do that. Okay. They, so go ahead. So it, it's it's interesting that the when uh, barricade devices became available, uh, you would have thought that it would have been um, dealt with in. The public safety world, meaning fire and police, right. it was actually being governed by commerce and housing um, and building code. So the building inspectors are the ones that actually have to uh, look at what you are installing and putting in. Um, and there are certain requirements that it has to be able to be released with one or two moves, depending on the age of the child and your fire suppression system. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the ability, because we do have a sprinkler system, that we can use a, um, a two-move uh, removal of a, a barricading device. It is a cheaper option. The barricade device? The, the, what we're, yeah. the ratchet straps. It is a cheaper option than some of the more commercial barricade devices. And we, we believe that we are also getting uh, the same level of, of safety based on that cost. So the, the barricade devices are sort of passive, right? You put it at the door. Yes. It does its job knowing to be there, to move away from the door. The ratchet straps require active participation or not? No. Okay. Once it's there, it's there and kids can move. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, I had the same question on, about the SROs as, uh, as I have on the mental health um, intervention specialist in the high school, and, or excuse me, in the school system. Um, and I know that's going to be subject to further discussion. In yeah. The, the nice part was of that conversation was that a lot of the conversation around a mental health specialist also aligned with the work that's happening in the well-being task force. Right. Yeah. And so there was overlap there. And because our counselors are participating in both, they had that um, ability to connect the dots. And so I think what you'll see is um, they, we will move forward with low or no cost recommendations 
but if we were to get to the point where we felt like a mental health specialist was uh, an essential aspect of our safety security plan and our well-being task force, that would probably result in a recommendation. Um, you know, we, we had some discussion about this before. Obviously, it's not before us now. I mean, there's a way to recommend it, but clearly, if, if we're allocating uh, scarce dollars to do things, it would be my personal preference to allocate dollars towards folks who could prevent a, an incident rather than folks who have to respond to nonviolent incidents. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and thank the safety committee and the folks from the staff, the folks from the community who've been involved and who've given a lot of time. Uh, I know the, the GPD's been very helpful, the TFD's been very helpful, um, the Sheriff's Department, so we're appreciative of that. Yeah. Uh, I didn't mean to dominate this conversation. Anybody else have any I, questions? I have, a, I have a couple questions. One, on the citizen aid part, mm -hmm. the kits for the classrooms, how many classrooms, what is the goal for the, the number for the classrooms? How many classrooms? One, one kit per classroom. And how, excuse my ignorance, how many classrooms so do we have? 162. Okay. And what's the cost of a kit? Right around $50. Okay. And that comes with some training. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I I think might be worth looking into is, um, there are a lot of mental health, behavioral health resources in the county mm -hmm. that we might be able, I, I think it'd be worthwhile reaching out and I'd be happy to do that since I work in that field about opportunities to partner yep. where possibly we could um, you know, save some expense or see, what, see what's available. We'd appreciate um, that. But, and, and I'd be. Lou did talk about that, so that's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd be at, at an appropriate time when, if we think it's Thank you. something we'd like to do. I, I think it's worth exploring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? No. We do have thirty-seven thousand dollars put aside from the New York Randall Community Authority next year um, for safety stuff. That's off the list of the things that Tanya has. Um, to fund some of those projects. Uh, one other point, and Dallas, don't rat me out. <laughs> if we are to do something with the key scan system, um, since we are such a strong partner with the rec district, that might be something we consider approaching them to, yep. to help participate in since so I, I know it's such a strong partnership and it's appreciated by the GRD, the, the yeah. generosity and support of the school district that, and, and, and they're using the system. Yeah. What we, what we um, Andy and I sit down every year, we, tent, we have a, uh, a contractual agreement, so to speak, for their co-location right. here. And part of that agreement is a $10,000 in-kind or you know, some type of donation. Right. And so what we do is we usually look at what the needs are that would be mutually beneficial um, in, in making a joint purchase or something like that. This would be one of those items that could be part of that conversation that would be mutually beneficial because they do use the system. A lot of times the GRD might be the last group right. beyond our custodians that's leaving the buildings at night. Um, I remember, and I've shared this um, this story with the safety committee. When I first got to Granville, um, the police chief at the time handed me a stack of calls on open doors that was this tall, and um, and so we we did go take a lot of effort to try and bolster an antiquated um, locking mechanism system. And so we're now down to this, but what we need to do is educate our parents, community members, and staff that um, you know, propping doors is not in the best interest of student safety. 
And so uh, that's more of the issue now than the actual mechanisms, but we also need to update the system so it's functional. And, and, and the GRD, I know, pounds into the coaches yeah. about propping the doors open. And, you know, it's a constant, it's an ongoing struggle about, because the coach wants to, because they have limited time in the gym, they want to start their practice on time, but, you know, if a kid comes late, um, it's a struggle, but the, the door shouldn't be propped open. Regards, and it's not only the GID. No, oh no, 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 it happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah and as a as a coach, I see it, and I know I make a lot of people mad. I just shut the door. Yeah. Anything else? No, thank you. Uh, we are now at that portion of our agenda uh, where we have some of those comments. If you have uh, anything you'd like to, uh, to say publicly, please step to the podium, state your name and address. Uh, we typically ask that you limit your comments to three to five minutes, but please feel free. There's a mad rush to the podium. No? Last chance? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll close the public comment section and we'll move to board discussion. Um, we had um, identified a discussion in general terms on um, reflections on the funding forums, the three funding forums that we held with the community, uh, levy discussion, potential uh, levy discussion going forward. Obviously, there's nothing before us tonight to decide on, but I think it's a good opportunity to sort of share some observations and some reflections about what we've seen, what we've heard, and um, the thoughts about moving mm -hmm. forward. So, Daryl, throw it out to the board. Before the board starts the conversation, Rush, you mentioned it earlier, but I want to reiterate it right now. There are several items that the board is approving tonight that are a first step that do not obligate the board in any way to, um, to ultimately make a decision in July. Um, so there are several items in the action agenda that will be related to the levy that none of them are binding, but they are something that's necessary from a timing standpoint mm -hmm. to set the stage for a decision in July. Thank you. So just another opportunity to make that point is always yes. beneficial. And clearly, we haven't made any determination no. on anything yet. Yep. Okay. Comments? I, I found the funding form tonight to be very useful, right? And, and uh, the more community input we get, the better. And I think it was really functional to have a discussion on the spending side. And I think we've had a lot of conversation in the community over the last months on the on the income, the revenue side that we get from taxes and things like that, which is a it, the same same equation, right? It's the other side of the coin to some extent, right? But it's a challenging one even for any of us to understand the complexities of funding formulas and the taxation options and so forth so I was sort of like refreshed to get back to you know the fundamentals of what we do right and the product that we provide and what the cost of that is that we provide and I think that's a really useful perspective so I think Mikey did a great job of putting that outline together again and I think that provides some really good talking points but I also think we need to like dig into that a little bit more and again understand like what's optional you know what's state required right and and what can we do uh, about that and I, I don't want to do it necessarily in a threat kind of sense but I think we need to be just as transparent as always right and really understanding what our real costs are and things mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's important to note on the spending side that the board and administration and staff uh, really try and um, allocate resources to the best interest of students in the most efficient manner possible. Um, and I talk about um, in, in budgeting, you know, there's a scarcity mentality and there's an efficiency mentality. When you're in a scarcity mode, people hoard. Um, when you're in an efficiency model or mentality, people look for ways to be more efficient and save max dollars to allocate to a specific purpose. And I, I feel like over my seven year tenure, maybe eight years now, um, it that that 
efficiency mentality is all the way through the organization. And, and we look for ways to place our dollars in an area or in an expenditure in a way that really has the max benefit to the students. But we always look to be more efficient. So when opportunities present themselves, we do projects like the efficiency project where we replace boilers and LED lighting. There are ways that we can reallocate positions um, so they fit a broader need like we did with the FCC FCS position this year in partnership with CTEC. So really always looking at that efficiency piece is, it's never gonna stop. That's part of the way that we operate and do business. So I think that's important to state. That was just a filler, so someone else could, no, just, just kidding. Yeah, well, I, think, I think that's critical that we continue to kind of reassess positions and like, you readjust uh, you know administration and where you do it I mean we're trying to do sort of more with less right and we're kind of forced to in this case which forces you to but I think that we've actually been extremely good proactively in the past mm -hmm. right and I hate for people to think it's like oh it's just because they didn't pass the levy that they're gonna be efficient right that's really not the case right there's so much work that happens mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis right with all the allocation of our resources and spending and so forth across all the different dimensions that people don't necessarily, it's not as visible. Right. Right, and that's sort of maybe unfortunate. They don't appreciate the work that goes into it or they haven't seen all those decisions. But I think the more we start to surface like what our real expenses are, it'll become more obvious. And what how we do relative to our comparison districts is great data. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's a great point, Thomas. I think uh, one of the areas of concern I have is uh, the folks may think that the reduction in force that we undertook last month uh, was sim simply trimming the sales, cutting off low excess, fat with unnecessary staffing. It wasn't. It, those cuts will impact student education. It will impact the quality of student life. Uh, in a very real way, beginning when students come back into the classroom on the first day of school in August. Uh, and so, as we look at how we deal with uh, our financial challenges going forward, it, it's not as easy as saying uh, we can make additional cuts and we can, we can align uh, our expenses with, um, with a notion of affordability. Frankly, it's a, it's a choice and it's a, it's a binary choice, which is, what do we want to see in our schools? What do we value in our educational system? And how do we find ways to pay for that? Um, it's not a, uh, despite the fact that we broke it down you know, by some significant line item tonight, in many ways it's not, a, it's not an a la carte menu. And we, can, we can certainly take um, aggressive steps to inflict significant cuts in the budget, but those cuts in the budget will significantly materially impact the quality of, uh, of the student experience in Granville. And, and in my personal view, you know, the reason that people are here because of the student experience in the schools in Granville. And so I, I think that, you know, that's, I don't want anybody to, to, to be under the illusion that that's, um, you know, an easy choice and that, um, and that it's, it's either or. I mean, we said when we put the, the last levy on the budget, uh, excuse me, on the ballot, that we did so because we, we were trying to address what we saw as um, a real meaningful, significant financial need going forward. And that, that if it failed, that didn't mean there wouldn't be a levy to follow. The way schools are financed in, in the state of Ohio, there are always levies. Uh, the alternative is, is drastic, dramatic, material cuts. And so, you know, as we think about this going forward, our challenge continues to be how do we, how do we frame up that discussion? How do we uh, put that information out there? And it's been suggested earlier at the, at the forum that one of the things we ought to do is be um, blatantly transparent about what gets cut. Uh, the next time around, and that's something that I think we 
have to seriously consider. Because that that would be the impact of looking at this. I think one of the things we we've got to contemplate here uh, tonight and in the coming weeks before we vote um, in July is whether we come back on the ballot in November, which is the next election. There are folks in this community who have suggested that we should that we should wait until next spring, until. <laughs> And I'm paraphrasing here, here until the crisis is real, uh, until we're, we have one foot over the cliff. Um, and my, my personal view is that would be an application of our responsibility um, and our obligation to the community and to the school district and to the students that, we, that we're here to, to serve. Uh, but we, we do have to think about that. There is a sentiment within some quarters, and I can't begin to guess how significant it is, Materially, but it's but it's but it's out there that we should wait and and not go forward on the ballot in, in November. Um, it's something that, that I would encourage us to contemplate, talk talk about, think about. Um, I'm not advocating it, um, but it's but it's a sentiment that's that's been raised, and so I think we have to think about that. We have to think about um, what the right number is, whether we go on the ballot in November, whether we go on the ballot next May, you know, as Jen pointed out earlier, um, you know, we respect the pay to participate, but we have to decide whether that's a permanent position or whether we'd like to fund, see if we can fund around that again, and see if we can fund around other things. Um, honestly, you know, I, um, there are, there are positions and we've discussed some of them tonight that frankly we ought to be donating excuse me devoting resources to um, whether they impact mental health whether they impact physical security in the, in the schools whether they impact library services whether they impact uh, student services there yeah, I'm not naive enough to think that we have a, a, a never-ending source of funding for all of that and one of the things we've always done to your point Jeff is we've We've made tough choices in the past. We've been prudent about where we spend money. Um, we do not have a uh, an over-the-top Taj Mahal like uh, notion of our physical facilities in the community, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, we provide good opportunities. We provide accessible uh, facilities, but, um, but but we're not excessive. Um, so I think we, we will always do what we've done in the past, which is continue to be prudent. But we really have to think, uh, we're challenged, I think, to, to find ways to identify um, sources of funding for the things that we think are important. And we do make sure to stand ready. In terms of mechanism, so I'm going to go back down to the nitty gritty a little bit rather right. than the big picture. Are we under the same constraints? With an, with an income tax either earned or total as we were before, given the cuts that we made. So like in our you know previous, in going for it in May, we, did, we, 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 had, we had said that we need to pass an income tax either in May or November, just because of the way it ratchets up and the way money gets collected. Um, are we under that same constraint? It's more comfortable still to do it in November. Um, with the reductions that we made, we have a little bit more flexibility to, to do it in, in May, mm -hmm. you know, next year, um, that we would not have had under the forecast without reduction. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we could, we could do the income tax in May. It, we get into a tighter situation um, the first year. Mm -hmm. Um, we can probably manage around it uh, with because of the reductions that we will make. Barring but, any significant change yes. right. in right. any funding mechanism that might change. Right. <laughs> it wouldn't permit us to potentially reinstate any services or reduce any fees in the following school year, probably to be able to hit that bogey. I don't know. No, no the, right. the certainly um, with an income tax, we would not be able to restore any services probably for an additional one to two years. 
uh, before the, until the revenue adequately came up, you know, got up to speed. With the main income tax rather than the income. Correct. Yes. Yeah, because we lose the whole year of right. collection revenue. Right. So realistically, November is still yeah. like if we want to consider an income tax of whatever kind. November is November still, is probably a better choice. It's still the better choice yeah. than to try and move. So if we, yeah, I'm not again, I'm not advocating that mm -hmm. we don't go. I mean, I actually feel like I don't believe in hitting the fiscal cliff. To be completely honest, <laughs> I don't think that's responsible. I don't know. Like, there's so many. I don't think public education should be run like a business. But there's some people who do, and I would like. And some of those are the people who are advocating that we. Um, go to the fiscal cliff, but I'd like to ask them, well, what, what business would ever go to a physical cliff <laughs> um, before trying to secure more funding, but that's just me. Um, uh, so, um, so I'm not advocating one way, way or the other, but I, it's, it's important to understand, I think, that you know, if, if income tax is what we want to do, then it's still prudent that we go. It's you know, best you know, for the fiscal health of the district to do it in November. And more cost effective. For it, the, it would cost us a thousand dollars in November. It would cost us fifteen thousand <coughs> in May. Because we'd be the only thing on the ballot yes. in May. Fifteen thousand. It would cost us between ten and fifteen thousand dollars for us to be on the ballot in May because most likely we are the would be the only thing on the ballot, and so we would have to pay for the entire cost of the election in, in November. Yeah, we, there's. Yeah, governor's. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's split among statewide issues and right. countywide issues, um, so it's a much lower mm -hmm. cost to us for the administration of the of the election. I wasn't at, able to be at the meeting last week, but it's my understanding that there wasn't any real consensus out of there on what kind of tax to go for. Is that? Uh, I would say that's accurate. Um, you know, I, I think. The way that we've structured the forum has, has been looking at methodology, mm -hmm. looking at scenarios, looking at budget. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things I hope to get out of this discussion is you know, what other information would you like to have from the community that's participating in these forums to inform your ultimate decision. And at some point, you know, I think you, would, you might want to see, you know, Okay, let's let's take a straw poll or something to say what are people favoring at this point? After all this information's been delivered, you know, what are people orienting to as far as a methodology? Because I think that's your first decision. Yeah. First is methodology, second is level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. I, I mean, it seems like with the the first two we focused on the revenue side, this last one we focused on the budget side. And, and I guess I would like to have more of a survey from the community on the budget side. Like, what do you want out of our schools? Do you want to like not have librarians and cancel other programs, or do you want to do what we did in the past, or do you want to do more than that, right? And I, so I think some like budget scenarios are going to be really important in the planning. I mean, we can do all kinds of taxation scenarios, which we sort of like have to do to meet the budget scenario. But I think first you have to decide what you want to be, right? And then once you say you want to be that, right? Like then you figure out how you get there from a mechanism perspective on the revenue side. And I don't know what that, how to facilitate that forum, mm -hmm. but I think that's kind of the poll that we need is a little bit about like, who do you want to be? You know, mm -hmm. do you want to have music in the schools? Do you want to have extracurricular programs? Do you want to have, you know, foreign language the elements? Do you want to have librarians, right? Those are all things that we need to figure out how to scale and scope that a little bit mm -hmm. and get that feedback with the full understanding of it costs. Sure. Right, like, so you can't just pick this and say, I don't want to pay taxes, right? You have to pick that with an awareness of, there's an expectation of the finances associated with it, but I think that would be very helpful for me, right? And and hopefully folks are able to connect those decisions with the reality of the revenue that needs to be generated, and not, you know, come up with hypothetical other solutions mm -hmm. where it comes from. But that would be helpful for me in another forum. I found it was helpful tonight. I, I don't I don't disagree. I think the challenge is, and and we've sh I, I I am very appreciative of the people that have come to the. The, the, the last two forums, but to get a true consensus of the community yeah. That's true. No, outside of the forum is, is, is tough and a challenge because, um, and, I, and I appreciate their input and I am 
one of the one of the things I'm very happy about having those forums is we've had good exchanges. The boards, I think, has been listening to options. I like that we have seven mm -hmm. scenarios to look at. Um, and I thought we did a, a, a really good job last week of, of explaining those um, different scenarios that we could approach versus the levy. Um, it'd be great if we could pay for a poll and mm -hmm. to get some substantial numbers, something scientific. Um, because I don't know if it's really a fair assessment of of the folks that come to the forum. Mm -hmm. um, I do appreciate it, and yeah. it's great, and their, their value and their coming, I can't thank them enough for it, because it's really important. I wish, I wish as many people had come to the second and the third as did the first. Mm -hmm. But the people that came to the first, we got a lot of, good, a lot of great feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think we've engaged with people that were opposed to the levy. Um, for a number of different reasons, and I think they've, from my interaction, they're appreciative that the board is, is open and willing to listen and, and trying to decide how we go about this. And I, and I think there's been some education with the community about how, how, we, can, how we fund our schools mm -hmm. and the limitations we have and the unfunded mandates. and. It's great to say run it like a business, and that's a great theory, but a school district is not just a regular business. I've run a business, and there's, there's certain things we just, we have to do that we don't have a choice with. Um, and, and unfortunately, there are things that we do now, and we do them very well, that we're not mandated to do. And I hate that we have to, that it, that it, it comes down to that. Because mm -hmm. as, as Mr. Janice said, and I can say from my experience, that's why we moved here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love this community, but I moved here for the schools and the education my children received. And I'm hoping people appreciate why they moved here and that that they, hopefully they bring to the table the idea of paying it forward so other children have the same opportunities that theirs had. Because at least personally, I feel if that's, that's the least I can do to pay back the advantages and the things that my children received, is if I can do that for the next generation, being an old man here and my kids are grown, I, I feel like that's, that's the least I can do for, for my community is to try to offer those same opportunities, if not more, if not more for those kids. But I think the dialogue has been really good and real healthy, and it's not social media, it's people interacting, which I think is just a wonderful thing in this society that we talk face to face, and it's very civil, and we've, and we've heard good ideas on both sides are, for me, interesting ideas that I'd love to see if we can pursue. And they're, and they're, worth, they're worth looking at. Um, now, sometimes we can't do things because we're not a business. Mm -hmm. We have rules and laws and things that we have to abide by. But I think if we're willing to look at those things and explain to people why we can't do it, um, that, that furthers our education of what what we have to do to provide the the service the outstanding services in my opinion that our school district offers. Both Russ and, and Fred alluded to the fact that so many people moved here for the schools. Um, is there any way of quantifying those who move away? once they're done teaching in the schools? I know that you mentioned from the time the last income tax, the all income tax was on the ballot, and I don't remember what year that was. 2000. 2000, until now 50% of the homes have turned over. Mm -hmm. 
Just about, yeah, just under 50%. Right. Yes. Um, anyone here is anecdotally that that's right. the case when you graduated, house goes on the market. Uh, it would be interesting to know because that that doesn't cover the cost of educating a child. Everybody contributes to that. Um, it would also be interesting to know if it's possible to quantify how many local dollars follow unfunded mandates elsewhere. I don't know if there's any way for you to it, use. That, this, the second is probably an easier thing to do than the first. Yeah. Um, I think that's valuable information. Yeah, I, it is It mm -hmm. is actually not real difficult for us to come up with a number of what would be locally generated dollars that are going to educate resident students who are not attending our schools. Right. Um, that is that is not a difficult calculation. The the first thing that you asked whether we could do or not would actually be a very interesting study. Um, it might be able to be done. Um, the hard part would be <coughs> whether we can historically go back and get the addresses of graduating seniors, say, over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. which we may be able to do. Um, I could merge those with the Licking County property database um, which does include um, sales data mm -hmm. yeah and dates of sale it having experience in the past merging addresses across platforms um, yeah. with better software than I have available to me here is a is is become somewhat of a manual process. And so you be, the reason I say that is because if in one place it says drive and in another place it says DR period, right. they don't match. Right. Um, you don't get an exact match. Um, there are ways of doing fuzzy math. It, it could be attempted. It would be, it's not something that would be able to be done next week. Um, it is something that maybe over a couple of months could we I could take a shot at. Um, I know how I know how to do it. It's more a matter of whether you whether I can actually do it. Right. The reason I ask is that a number of the comments that have come up during the levy campaign and during the forums have alluded to the fairness of an earned income tax versus an all income tax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if there is a significant portion of our school population that is coming as pure consumers and moving on, that that is also a fairness issue. Mm -hmm. So I I would be curious. I don't expect you to need to stand on your head. <laughs> or like I pay that. money for that. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that I think perhaps did not get enough emphasis during the campaign is the fact that an income tax earned or all does not eliminate property tax no. on existing residents and residences. I mean, there's still a, a substantial property tax burden spread. Universal. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, those are my okay. Thank you. So, in terms of timing, our July meeting has to be before the 10th. July 9th will be our board okay. meeting. And um, are we looking at another forum before that? 
Uh, we are now. <laughs> <laughs> the board president made the comment earlier. <laughs> so, what else are we going to yeah. do? <laughs> that, that will be something that we will have to discuss prior to the end of this meeting. But my, my concern about doing a straw poll of, of any sorts is that it would be a very selective. Mm -hmm. Even if we did it like by Survey Monkey, because so many people are out of town between now and then and vacationing and things like that, that I don't know. Um, how oh, valid it would be <coughs> anyway. Yep. Um, so I, I caution that that may not be an entirely useful use of time or endeavor. Um, I don't mind another forum, and if you know people can come prepared to sort of talk about the things that Thomas raised, that's, that's fine. I don't know, though, that um, doing that kind of a poll at this point yeah. gains, us a, yeah. gains, uh, gains us a whole lot. I've got one other quick question about our um, smorgasbord of options here. <laughs> the ones with millage refer to a continuing period. The ones with income tax refer to no period in particular. Is, is that a, the way they have to be? That is a function of the law as it is right now. Okay. Um, the income tax, the duration is a part of the second resolution, okay. not a part of the first resolution. Okay. But now with a, the changes in the property tax law, ballot issues that were done a, last year because of the Delaware Career Center fiasco, um, you actually have to specify the period in the initial resolution. So that is that is strictly a function of what the law says you have to do now. I would prefer not to have to to do it that way. That would be part of the second res the second resolution. That is not a choice in property tax. Thank you. Just as a an option. Going out of town. Yeah, um, because okay. I'm. I'm gone next week. Uh, so the week after is the 25th through the 29th. Um, the 27th is a Wednesday. Um, the week after that is July 4th. So you do it during the fair. <laughs> a lot of people there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll set it up at the Quantas I don't tent. know that the information that you will glean will be of value to you. Dunk the superintendent. <laughs> 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 it keeps coming up. It does keep coming, coming up. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. People miss the dunk tank, so. Yeah. So, I, I, so either the week of the 25th or yeah. uh, the week prior to the meeting on the 9th. Or prior to the meeting on the 9th. I think it's just the easy way to get to them. I, I, um, you can't put on the 9th. Yeah. We heard from some folks that, that getting to a 5 o'clock meeting is a bit of a challenge, so. I might prefer doing it on a night other than the meeting of the ninth, so that we could start it, you know, at six thirty or something like that. Yeah. So folks can get there by either the twenty fifth or twenty seventh. I'm yeah. open to maybe at twenty fifth at six thirty uh, on Monday at six thirty, like a nor our normal board mm. meeting time, maybe. I'm going to be traveling back. <laughs> oh, you are. So, yeah. so I twenty seventh. I will. 27? I will, the twenty seventh would be better, but 630? yeah, mm. six thirty on the twenty seventh. Can you do that, Russ, or no? I'll be traveling back all the I, I can maybe able to make it. I can try. I mean, I can adjust plans and try and get back earlier on the 25th. Do we really need you anyway? No. <laughs> Just joking. Clearly. Just joking. <laughs> Just joking. Are you talking to me? <laughs> no, yeah, you do. <laughs> Jeff, do, Jeff does a great job putting up the paper. Though. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I was totally joking. No, I would I, You I, need I, him for that. sure. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think 6.30 on the 25th could work. How about, alternatively, how about July 2nd? You're not going to get any, you're yeah. going to have people mm -hmm. gone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to. Okay. Yeah. So I would say either, I, I would say the 25th at 6.30. Let me check tomorrow on the 27th okay. and uh, we'll see what I can do about that. All right. Okay. We will communicate out right. via the Thank you. media. Um, yeah, no, I, look, we've, we've said at the start we wanted to hear from the community. I think we've done that. If 
it may well be that you know a fourth meeting is completely unnecessary, but I want to make sure that we've done everything we can to invite everyone from the community who has an opinion or thoughts about a better way to come in and talk to us mm -hmm. and share that view with us. And we will listen. And as promised, eight years ago, I will provide a recommendation that will be some an interesting conversation between the two of us we've had multiple um, but I I view it as my responsibility to say this is something that I I would recommend um, just from that standpoint and then you can factor that into your equation um, and and I, Mike and I have gone back and forth on on all of these scenarios more than once at least all these scenarios yes well, and it, it, as you both said consistently there is no perfect solution correct and trying to find the best um, best possible solution that, that we can yeah mm -hmm. any more comments okay all right uh, board reports board reports yes jen so i have to go to my phone because my printer broke so matt oh matt's not here anymore <laughs> 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 Got a text Mr. Happing, is that okay yeah. if we? Yeah. <laughs> Matt got a text. I just have a few. <laughs> it's your life. <laughs> oh, that was good. <laughs> my information is in my email, so um, no. I just like to report out um, the CTEC um, Honors Night was the Friday of Memorial Day weekend, and mm -hmm. um, Mr. Durston and Mr. Brown joined. You know, were there, and um, I always like just to give a little bit of information about the graduates. Out of um, out of CTEC, and so there were 254 uh, students who completed their um, CTE education. Um, the seniors had earned approximately $709,000 through school to work employment opportunities. Um, the seniors earned $539,000 in college scholarships and have earned 622 college credits while enrolled at CTEC. And so those were some of the statistics that the superintendent shared um, at graduation. She also has everybody stand up who completed a um, certification in their field, is going to be working in their field, is going to be continuing their education in their field, um, who um, earned some sort of an honor through the, the student um, HOSA, which is the um, health, or, you know, their, their student um, competition groups, and pretty much every single student stood up, stood up for one or more of the reasons that uh, that she had um, announced, and so it was a very successful class. And they, you know, lots of going, you know, going on to college, going on to military, going on to work in their field. And that's one of the things that CTEC gets um, graded on is is um, the numbers who go on to work or either on to higher education or work in the field that they actually did their study in. And I think we always get an A, um, mm -hmm. um, or B plus or an A in, in that. So. Um, it's a it's an amazing resource. I you know love being you know representing Granville on that board and um, really happy with all of the collaborations that we've done with them over the over the past few years. So, um, but that's I just like to share graduation Great. statistics. Um, yeah. Um, next. CTEC does a great job. They do. Yeah. And we had we had more Granville students that went through their that uh, graduation than than usual. Yeah. So how many? Good. Good. We had eight. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. Good. Yep. That's all. I will put my phone away now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm self conscious. <laughs> well, Mr. Carpenter is going to do. confiscate it. <laughs> All right, a quick update on the GEF, uh, Granville Education Foundation met, um, and uh, a little bit of a passing of the torch, Wendy Battelle is the outgoing president, Laura Romano mm -hmm. is the incoming president of the GEF, so we're very thankful for her and the other officers. I don't have a complete list of those officers and trustees currently, I can probably bring that at some point in time, uh, but it's a fantastic group, and uh, Laura will do a great job continuing that. One of the actions that they took at their last meeting, uh, we'll see a, a nice long list of gifts in the, in the agenda here uh, for grants and things like that. They also had a significant and long discussion about supporting the school district more directly with the intermediate school orchestra position. And they did approve a $4,000 grant specifically to ensure that that position continues. Uh, they've had a great cooperative relationship with the music boosters. And in cases where they've received a request for a grant, they've partnered with the music boosters. In this case, the music boosters felt that this was in mutual interest, and so the GEF stepped up to that. So 
Um, so that's that's huge, and it's it was a, it's a real discussion, right? Because that's not their wheelhouse, that's not their standard, that's not what they do, and that wasn't a kind of a you know a carte blanche for continuing this in the future. That was like this is sort of a stopgap measure until our community figures out you know what we're going to do about funding our schools sustainably. So I'm very thankful that they have found a way in their budget to come up with that support. Um, and so we see that reflected in the agenda later. It's, it's interesting for our booster organizations and, and how they're stepping up, but I'm just very grateful that, you know, that they are such strong supporters of, of all that we do here. And that intermediate school orchestra position is a critical one in so many ways, not just for the kids it serves, but for the organization of the district. So they appreciated that mm -hmm. and they stepped up to it. Yep. Yeah. They also have several grants yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. that will be awarded. Okay. Any questions? Action agenda? All right. Uh, the first action item is 10.01 student handbooks for the 1819 school year. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, you heard from Mr. Durst earlier. Obviously, several jokes have followed. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the handbooks are at the elementary level, uh, minimal change, just natural updating, and then some of the items that you heard tonight. So, so it's the first and final reading with the changes that he proposed? Yes. Yeah. So what we're going to do is I can bring it back for another reading in July. Um, there are some deadlines for things to get printed. So um, do we actually still whatever. print them? No, we don't print the handbooks, okay. but there are some things that need to start moving forward from a Yeah, I'm not point. really comfortable yet moving forward with his recommendations on particularly, well, actually the cell phone one I'm okay with, but um, with the uh, merging of the um, two policies on substance abuse and tobacco, I'd like to think about that a little bit more. So do we not approve that one now or pending? Pending review? I think it's appropriate to do a first and a second reading. There are a lot yeah. of things that were proposed there that yeah. I think might benefit from some community vetting and feedback there. Um, and just having had one reading of it, I would, if it's not a significant administrative issue to be able to think through that and get some feedback, that might be valuable on those. So but do you, go ahead, Sam. I was, I was just gonna ask a question. Does it help or is it not, is it inappropriate? Could, can we pass some of them? Or do we want to do them as a group? Is my question. No. I, I, I think if it, at, at a minimum you could pass the elementary and intermediate because there's right. very little impact. Does that help at all? Or I, um, I'm just it, curious. it moves the ball at some level, but you know, because I understand the yeah. the thought on the on the the other two. So I, I think that's the most sense to me because you want the middle and high school together. So mm -hmm. what we need is a motion to table the middle and high school yep so moved second uh, who's that i'm sorry who's that Jen. i did sorry okay. Jen. Right. so yeah. discussion purposes for that so we would we would want a second reading uh, and discussion opportunity at our july meeting with respect to the middle and high school uh, handbook Mm -hmm. And all of the changes discussed for the high school that Mr. Durst proposed are also equally reflected in the middle school in terms of both the tobacco use and the self and the Correct. bring your own device. Correct. Policy changes. Okay. Okay. Is, is there? Let me ask. Um, and I, I share some of the same concerns. So are there things that the board wants to hear um, at the next meeting or in advance of the next meeting about the proposed policy changes that would help? Inform the decision. I, I'd like if he could forward, if we could get a written idea of what those exactly the changes he's talking about. That would that be helpful to me. I put that in the in well, I put that in the BIF. I think did you? I'm sorry. Two weeks ago. That's okay. Um, I can resend it. We we've had other things on our minds, so um, you know. I think typically we would have had a lot more advanced notice, but you know. We're, but it would we're be crushing. useful to have like what we what what is current, sure. as well as yep. what he wants it to change it to. Um, just a general reaction on the 
Or do we need to take a vote before we continue the discussion on, or is this still part it's of, still the, part of the discussion? It's still part of the discussion. Yeah. The original motion. Okay. Well, no. But I mean, we have another passed. motion on the table. We have a motion to the table. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's do that. Let's 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 vote. vote. I'm trying to think if we need to actually table it or if we can actually amend yeah. the original motion to remove the middle school and high school. I don't think we have to table the whole okay. thing and bring it back. That's fine. Amy, it was your motion, I think, originally. Fred? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was originally Amy's motion. Okay. Fred seconded. Um, so we need a motion to remove the middle school and high school from it, and then we could pass it without the. Okay. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Take a roll, please. On the motion to remove the yeah. middle high school. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Ms. D. No. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Janine. Aye. Aye. Okay. And now the amended uh, or the new motion is for the approval of the elementary and intermediate yeah. school. Yeah, that there's it's no standing. Standing. No, we have a motion. Okay. Standing. This is just a vote on the So it's still Mrs. Deeds and Mr. Mr. Wolf. Mrs. Deeds and Mr. Wolf. Okay. To, uh, yeah, the as amended. Right. Elementary and intermediate. And we're yeah. still yeah. discussing the elementary and intermediate. And we can still discuss no, that. No, I just drew the motion. Oh. Yeah. That's true. Right. Someone want to make a motion then to, yeah. um, to approve the elementary and intermediate school handbook. So moved. Second. Should we discuss that and discuss whether we think we need for the other one too as well? Because we're just sure, discussing. Probably yeah. So a good question about what we need to make that decision. I, I think I just need to do a little thinking myself and maybe surveying the community members and so forth and reviewing better the documents. So thanks for sending them out, but I didn't get into the red line detail about what the implications were and I had some questions on both yeah. policy changes. So I don't know that I need anything specific in there. But just to look at the documents right. sure. more closely, that would be great. We can do that. Anyone else? No. Okay. Mr. Miller. Aye. Director Corman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Deeds. Aye. Mr. James. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ten point oh two is the annual renewal of the uh, service agreement with ABI. So moved. Second. Questions? Just so you know, we're, we're in a longer period of a contract, but we renew them annually to do the evaluation process. And we're very satisfied with ABI. Okay. We still getting um, student comments back on that? Mm -hmm. on the There's a, a committee that looks at the satisfaction of the food <laughs> provided on a regular basis. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they have some opinions. Yes, they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> Any questions? Ms. Deeds. Aye. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Janine. Aye. Uh, the next handbook is the employee handbook for 1819. So moved. Second. And this is, there's no material change to just the updating of the years. Uh, the licensure professional code of conduct, the collective bargaining agreement were all updated last year. Um, and this is really just a, a document to help uh, teachers frame the expectation for performance. Second. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Ms. Eads. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Uh, next item is our annual renewal of the Global Scholars Diploma Program. Uh, there's an enrollment fee of $5,000 to participate in the Global Scholars. So moved. Second. Discussion. So um, I know I asked this before. Yeah. But of course, I forgot. How many students? We have uh, roughly 90 students participating in that program and at so the various levels. There are three levels. And the, the $5,000 covers the various events. Correct. So they, we, it's a payment to the Columbus Council on World Affairs, who is kind of the um, uh, 
guidance organization, they, they create the opportunities like at Honda and, and Nationwide and others that our students then participate in. Mm -hmm. And so really it's just the cost of those types of events. Do we have a supplemental associate with it as well? Mr. Hopping, it's built, oh, he left, he, he just left. Uh, uh, Mr. Hopping actually has a, a modification to his schedule to accommodate for uh, this program. It's not a supplemental. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that strikes me is we're looking to impose funding obligations on extracurriculars mm -hmm. and on um, students in a number of categories. And, and I'm not suggesting we modify this now, but one of the things I would think we would, uh, I think we should look at is whether this is the type of thing that students should pay for, as opposed to the district paying for. Um, you know, whether, whether we impose a fee on students who participate in the program, I'd be curious about your thoughts, and I don't have to express them now, uh, mm -hmm. about whether that would impact participation and impact the quality of the experience at all. But, um, Again, we're, in, we're at a point where uh, where we're searching for revenue everywhere. Right. And this may be an opportunity as well. A um, couple of points. One, I should say that for all the other districts in the consortium, it's a ten thousand dollar fee. But because we were a pioneer and the first pilot district, we've maintained our five thousand dollar fee. So we're already getting a discount. Uh, it is something that we could associate a fee with. Um, there are other fees that are tied to outside activities like youth and government, those types of activities. So it is something that we could look at as an option. Um, I would suggest if you want to need to do that, bring back a fee for that, a fee schedule for that item, but still move forward with the approval tonight. I, I'm fine with that. I, you know, to, to your point, I think, you know, I would ask it's more work, but I would ask to contemplate what are the similar activities we have, some that we charge fees for and others that we don't, mm -hmm. and also get to a schedule of those. Okay. I'll bring do that back in July. Do we have other extracurriculars that have fees beyond the activity fee or the post participation fee? Well, we have academic courses that right. have a fee associated with them, yeah. like labs and things like that. So yeah, and there are clubs that, yeah. like, the Spanish club might go to a Spanish-themed restaurant and right. the, parent, their, the parents pay for, for that. Mm -hmm. does, does the example of youth and government, does, their act, does the activity fee cover all of their Youth and costs? government is separate because it's actually run by the YMCA. Okay. So... It's a separate funding process. They pay, and you, the, the parent or the student bears the entire cost of that event. Thank you. I don't think we charge a fee for mock trial, do we? Okay. Is is there any fee? Is there any cost involved in mock trial? Um, there's a supplemental, I believe. Right. Mr. Wade received a supplemental. But the competition itself, it, there's no registration fee. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. V. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Janine. Aye. Bless you. Um, action item 10.05. I'd recommend an administrative and exempted employee salary schedule increase of 2% for cost of living. So moved. Second. Discussion? This is in line with the collective bargaining agreement. Um, although the administrators do not receive a step schedule increase. Right. I think this is consistent sort of my expectation for what we would do um, you know, remain um, in a um, fair and sustainable compensation schedule. Any other questions? Okay. 
Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Ms. Deed. Aye. Mr. Tenise. Aye. Thank you. Uh, 10.06 is the SOAR learning, Leading and Learning Collaborative Agreement with uh, Patel for Kids. Moved. Second. Okay, uh, the learning, Leading and Learning Collaborative is a two-fold contract which uh, involves uh, professional development and data analysis through Patel for Kids. Um, they do a lot of work just funding some of our internal metrics and looking at our data. Um, but they also provide professional development opportunities for strategic planning and also uh, a lot of the work around the portrait of a graduate. So that's something that we're going to be spending a lot of time on this next year and they will help facilitate that. Questions? Ms. Dean. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Jennings. Aye. Uh, the next item is 10.07, Contracted Service Agreement with Ohio State University. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, this is our uh, renewal of our contract for sports medicine services for our athletic trainings. Uh, people that work on the sidelines with our athletes Very at all of our sporting events. Same contract. Any changes to the contract? Nope. Contract remains the same. Tom, as I recall, as part of that contract, they uh, donate some additional medical services. They do. Yeah. Consultation time with uh, work teams. That's yep. correct. This would have been one of the types of expenditures when you asked earlier that was in the athletic, but not in right. the supplemental. This, right. would, this would be one of those. Mm -hmm. That is a, you know, having. Had a student who's injured and was able was seen for, by an orthopedist for free, mm -hmm. um, was, you know, very beneficial. Yeah. yeah, they they do it. They do a very good job. Very professional. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. D. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Tenney. Aye. Thank you. Uh, 10.08 is the replacement of uh, GES and GHS rooftop units. So moved. I'll let Amy have that one. I'll second it. <laughs> All right. Um, <coughs> you've heard a lot about our 20 year plan for a replacement of mechanicals and other items within our facilities, and this is. Uh, to update several of the rooftop units that are failing at the elementary and the high school. Amy will be happy with the elementary replacements. Um, <laughs> is, is, she paying, is she paying attention? Sarah's yeah. agreeing. Yes, Sarah's agreeing, but yes. Amy's, Amy's too busy talking. The, the, the rooftop units at the elementary. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, all of these items are uh, state state term bidded or items, so it's state term pricing. It's actually below state. They yeah. will get bid or below state term pricing. Yeah. So um, it's a good opportunity to keep in line with our 20-year plan. Yeah, and this is state term pricing. Hmm? What's that? State term pricing must not be negotiated very well if these are less than state term yeah. pricing. But that's another story. Yeah, and this is part of what was set aside for mechanicals in the current year budget. This is the last of the big expenditures okay. from the current year capital budget. Okay. Questions? Excuse me. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Janine. Aye. Okay. Uh, thank you. Consent agenda, 11.01, A through <coughs> 10, A through C10, so moved. Second. Okay, uh, I'd like to call your attention uh, 
Mr. Miller referenced the donations uh, previously from the Granville Education Foundation. Those are within our donations um, area. We have multiple supplementals for the 1819 school year. These tend to be our team leader and um, some of our fall sports. We have a long list of um, substitute teachers for the 1819 school year. Um, we have uh, replaced one intervention specialist, Jennifer Clark. Uh, we actually reallocated some intervention specialists and ultimately hired the replacement at the elementary or at the intermediate school. Um, but the original vacancy was at the high school with uh, Megan Strayer who left. Um, then we also have the renewal of some administrator contracts there. And I would call your attention to the resignations of Aaron Carpenter and Tom Craze. us to the financial laundry list. First is the approval of the May um, financial statement. So moved. Second. Um, I will not go through a long explanation um, as we just approved the five-year forecast late in May. Um, Nothing happened in May that we were not expecting to happen, so we are still um, on course from where we have been um, going into the five year forecast. So. Questions? I, I report the note. Um, Page six of your earlier study, your comparison with the um, back out the contribution, uh, the HSA contribution we, we front loaded this year. The expenses are two percent year over year, which is pretty darn uh, conservative and consistent with CPI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be accurate. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? <laughs> Take a roll. Ms. Eve. Hi. Mr. Miller. Hi. Dr. Corman. Hi. Mr. Wolf. Hi. Mr. Ginny. Hi. Thank you. Um, Twelve point oh two is the temporary appropriation for fiscal year nineteen. So moved. Second. This will allow us to continue to operate the district beyond June 30th. Um, there are, I thought there'd be, I don't think a copy of it ended up in the folder. There, there well. basically, there are three changes that are significant, of significant dollar amounts from what the appropriate final appropriation that you approved in May for this year. Um, there's a $600,000 increase in the appropriation for the operating budget to cover um, the changes in the operating budget that are yeah, from a year a year further along. Um, there's also about a $600,000 increase in the 022 fund, which is to accommodate the change that we made January 1st and how we're accounting for SPRS. Um, so that actually becomes cleaner. Um, but this year it was only in there for half a year. Um, so it'll be in there for a full year. And the last is about a $200,000 decrease in the uh, bond fund appropriation. That is because we are just making or have just made one of these. Uh, Tina's not paying attention. Uh, <laughs> She's got her phone. Put down your phone. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm just going to end the piece of this. The House Bill 264 loan was. Did we make that payment was just being made. The last payment on the old 264 loan. Um, that two hundred forty thousand um, dollars. This was the tenth and final payment on that from the two thousand nine issuance. So 
uh, the bond fund will go down correspondingly because we don't have to make that payment next year. Thank you. Any questions? Dr. Corman. Yes. Aye. Miller. Aye. Ms. Rule. Aye. Ms. Z. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Okay. Can I make a motion to combine 12.03 through 12.09 into one? Make yourself at home here. It's going to be a while. <laughs> under, under, at least on the income tax part of it, under state law, there has to be a separate resolution yes. and vote for each different option. You could combine them into all into one, but then we can only get certified for one. Yeah. Mm. That would be a problem. That would be a problem. Okay. So let's crush. So yeah. unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. and again yeah. to reiterate um, what Jeff said earlier, these are just to keep the the can moving down the road or the ball moving down the road. You are not obligated to do any of these things. I am obligated to send these to the Department of Taxation, the County Auditor, so that you can act on any one of them. So should do so, choose to do so at the July meeting. Keep in mind. You cannot act on anything at the July meeting that you are not voting on today. Um, so if all of a sudden someone had a great idea two weeks from now, um, that would necessitate a special meeting to take the first step over again because you cannot vote on something that you have not done this for. Okay, thank you. All right, so first we have a 12.03 is a earned income tax for $3.444 million, which should be the equivalent of three quarters of 1%. So moved. Second. Take the move. Ms. E. Aye. Ms. Rule. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janine. Aye. 12.04 an earned income tax for $4,590,000, the equivalent of 1%. So moved. Second. Mr. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Rule. Aye. Ms. D. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Third is a three million three hundred and eighty-eight thousand dollar income tax on all income, um, which is the equivalent of half a percent. So moved. Second. Ms. D. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Janine. Aye. Fourth is a income tax on all income for $5.1 million, which is equivalent of three quarters of 1%. So moved. Second. Nope. All right. Go for it. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. D. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. 12.07 is a resolution of necessity for a operating in property tax levy of 5.9 mills for a continuing period of time. So moved. Second. Ms. D. Aye. Ms. Wolf. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. 12.08, an operating levy for six and a half mills for a continuing period of time. So moved. Second. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Ms. D. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. And finally, a resolution of necessity for a to renew the 1.7 mil permit improvement levy for a continuing period of time. So moved. Second. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Rule. Aye. Ms. D. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Janine. Aye. We have a motion on to executive session to consider the employment of a public uh, a public employee or official. So moved. Second. Mr. Wilson. Ms. D. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Uh, there will be no further action. Thank you, all of you.